Matthew Kadish joins us this morning to talk about all the mangle drama and more on Midnight's Edge and Morning. Good morning, YouTube. It's Monday. Welcome to the Edge of the Internet. Midnight's Edge, that is. We have with us our good friend, Matt Kadish, who... Uh, has been doing nothing interesting lately at all. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. All quiet. Not at all. It's been just a <laughs> boring, insignificant week. Yeah. Or weekend, I should say. A completely eventless weekend. Yes. Not got, a got, damn thing happened. Got a big case of the Mondays. That's that's it. Oh, somebody should just <laughs> slap you for saying that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and with us, as always, is Andre the Boss Man. How are you doing? Greetings, everyone. I am good. Thanks for asking. How are you? I'm doing good, and I like the uh, office space reference already coming out of Matt. <laughs> and as we were saying, it's just been uh, one of those weekends where nothing happened. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. there was there's some movie that's filming. They started filming last week. Uh, it is one that we're yeah that we're supposed to be excited about. Apparently, at least James Mangold, the director of it, seems to think everyone must be excited about Indiana Jones, doesn't he? Does anyone else think it's weird that they're making a fifth Indiana Jones when they haven't made a fourth one yet? Oh, uh, well, like I posted on, I think it was Gary's thing. I'm like, you know, you got to try really, really hard to be worse than the last one. And they're off to a great start. <laughs> We've already lost a, the original director, Steven Spielberg, no less. Uh, and then we got a new one, James Mangold. Okay, we could do worse, right? Well, what does he do? He brings in Phoebe Waller-Bridge, which is probably at the request of Kathleen Kennedy, which, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's a fucking recipe for success right there. So just to double down and make sure that this thing is going to work even better after all this, like, the, the production's been leaking like a sieve all weekend. And at first I thought, maybe it's leaking because they're wanting this shit out there. That was until uh, fucking Bangle just starts spurging out this weekend. And, and we'll get yeah. into that because... Uh, Somebody here uh, was one of his targets. Yeah, indeed. Uh, actually, uh, but for, for those that uh, aren't paying attention to Twitter, and uh, if you don't, I salute you and keep it up. <laughs> we'll bring the yeah, relevant Sunday morning, I woke up drama to, to you when it, uh, when it comes. Yes. Or actually, no, I didn't wake up to it. What time did this start? It was like, was it Saturday night or Sunday morning? I can't remember. It was Sunday morning. Yeah, I was going to say, because I woke up to some shitter. I just got off Mead Radio. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but let's let's take it back to the very beginning. We will indeed, but let's say hi to a few haven't. people in the chat, though. First. Indeed, let's do We've that. We've got Mike, the Mike, Mexican Iron Man, hanging out with us. We got six. We got, go ahead, Andre. I can't say it. We've got, <laughs> mm. we got Mags. We got Prince Andrew. We got Ram Bam 3000. We got Silver Nova here. We got our good buddy Jesse hanging out. How you doing, hey, Jesse? Jesse? Yeah, Matt knows Jesse. Uh, we got Practical Jack. We've got uh, Billy D who sent us a super chat. We'll get to that real quick here soon. Speaking of super chats, we got one from uh, mm, as well. I can't talk. We got Nikki D also sent us a super chat. We'll get to that real soon here. We got Mr. Tickle Trunk with the wrench. We got Sailor Sonic. We have House of Trades Film School Rookie. We got Watt. Is that how you say that or what? <laughs> Miguel Farr, we got Alex Ashgan and so many more. Thank you for joining us this morning. We appreciate that. And uh, yeah, as you start to file in here, let's uh, get some super chats, Andre, and then we'll get into yes, the uh, news. And one we can bring up on screen is Spider Unlimited, who says, mentioned during Mead Radio yesterday that nothing has happened yet with Mangold. Like clockwork, he had a meltdown on cue. So yeah, that's uh, that's funny. And Max is on Twitter now. Yeah, but uh, use with caution. Uh, so what I'm going to say about that. Mr. Tickle Trunk must be in agreement because he says Twitter is bad for your mental health, kids. Okay. I see what you did there, and it's pretty awesome, and, and I approve. And Billy D says for ten dollars. Last Crusade had the perfect ending to the indie, tril indie trilogy. I still haven't seen Crystal Skull. 
and don't intend to see this either. But congrats to Midnight's Edge for all the content this movie will generate. Yeah, it's. Uh, I honestly didn't think it was going to, but hey, that's how wrong you can be sometimes. And rrr, mm, says, hello, gents. Hello, everyone. Well, hello. to you. And yeah, back and to that last one, I was like, I thought this was a movie we wouldn't start talking about for another six months or so. <laughs> well, Mangold certainly proved us wrong there, didn't he? And before we get into that, first super chat of today was also from Nikki D, who says, for $20, thank you so much. Really enjoyed your low-key editorial. Glad well, to hear it, because it almost killed me. <laughs> yeah. And Tom, of course, is the one doing all that magnificent editing in assembling the video and making it as slick as it is. Well, Without that, it's just my words. So well, yeah. when you don't yeah. have access to a lot of images, you got to search everywhere for Loki stuff when there's only one episode. <laughs> it's kind of not easy. Yeah. And aren't you grateful that I bring in Dexter and Game of Thrones? And all oh, that other so, stuff well, as Game well. of Thrones wasn't so bad outside. I've never seen it. So I didn't know what went where. So it was like trying to put together a puzzle in the dark. Uh, now, Dexter was just like, for some fucking reason, they have like no high resolution pictures anywhere of this show for say it was like did this show exist in a time when the internet was like the younger it's not that old of a show is it uh, no it's it ended in 2012 that's what i'm trying to figure out here i'm like is it because like usually when you have problems like this when i can't find high resolution pictures it's because a show falls in that weird category of like early internet and late 90 days you know so there's a lot of really bad resolution pictures out there but now for some reason dexter is tough to find you anyway that's fucking neither here nor there. Let's get into this because we only have our guests for a while. And we have a few other people in the back yeah. room. We're gonna we also in. we also uh, have the rest of the super chats uh, continued after a look editorial. Nikki D I says, apologize. sadly, don't think the audience will care about the narrative implications introduced in the first episode. The MCU fandom is mostly casual consumers that aren't critical of cause and effect. My mom would not understand this show. I'll tell you that right now. No, exactly. It's like, yeah, and, and that's not necessarily a good thing. But uh, let's uh, let's move on with proceedings. We have a yes. couple of people in the waiting room, and yes. one of them we're going to bring in right now because he's going to assist us on this journey uh, from the from the uh, aspect of being someone that's also in the industry. Welcome, script doctor. He's uh, not good, late. I forgot to send him the link. <laughs> good morning, and uh, good to see you again, Matthew. Uh, granted, it's not the best of circumstances, but it's still somewhat entertaining. <laughs> what are you talking about? These, these are great circumstances. These like, are great? Well, nothing <laughs> happened this weekend, Bill. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> well, nice, boring Sunday. So. Yeah. Just but a typical, yeah, let's, uh, typical Sunday in the Kadish household. And, yeah. Wow. Cork jars Actually, and all. The, for, for those that uh, that aren't following Twitter, tell us this this uh, this uh, Sunday in the Kadish household, you decided to make a tweet, <laughs> one where you broke down why people maybe shouldn't be too excited about the next Indiana Jones movie, and you put some very very good points there. Why don't you take us through what inspired this initial tweet and what was in it? Well, it was actually on Saturday, and uh, I, had, I had been seeing these leaked um, Indiana Jones set photos on Twitter, kind of making the rounds, and uh, Harrison Ford just looked awful in these uh, pictures. And um, so I just made a, a tweet like I often do, just sitting on my couch offhanded, and I just said to anyone thinking Indiana Jones 5 might be good, let me just point out a few things. I said, Steven Spielberg is not directing the movie. And to me, that's a big deal because Steven Spielberg is most directly responsible for how great those first three movies were. Um, Kathleen Kennedy is producing. She's the shot caller on this thing. Harrison Ford is 78 years old. He's four months older than Joe Biden at this point. Come on. Uh, so like, um, you know, uh, just pointing out like, as an action star, he's pushing the edge of believability in terms of like what he's able to do. And uh, at the time, I thought that the because I hadn't really been keeping up with it, I thought that um, John Can Jonathan Kasdan was the writer of the movie, and he was the writer screenwriter for Solo as well. You're not alone. I didn't know they brought in a new writer with Mangold. That yeah. just like, kind of like I, I, I didn't even know. 
I didn't even know Mangold was involved in the movie. Like, oh, I, I did. I had kind of like I had read about it a long time ago, but I'd forgotten when I made this tweet. So I was just kind of like laying out my case for like why I think uh, Indiana Jones Five isn't going to be all that great based off of what I've seen so far. And I didn't, didn't know anything about the story, didn't know anything about the plot, anything like that. It was just based off these factors. I was like, temper your expectations because this is not going to be a very good indie movie based off of like these four factors. And I just put it out there on a Saturday, didn't think anything about it. And then Sunday morning I woke up, I checked my phone and Twitter had, was, had like a billion notifications for me on it. And I was like, what the hell's going on here? Cause I hadn't seen something like that since the birds of prey kerfluffle that I also was involved in. And, um, yeah, so, you uh, sure know how to attract the right people to your Twitter. <laughs> well, <laughs> this has happened before. <laughs> yeah, I, I told you, Andre, that Hollywood cares about what I think. So, like, <laughs> I'm a big, a big deal in the, in the town. People, Is that a big deal? Want, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I started going through my notifications. I was like, what the hell's going on here? And usually when this ty type of stuff happens, it's some type of blue check mark picks up on one of my tweets and their army of fans kind of comes after me. And in this case, it had the blue check mark in question happened to be the writer and director of the new Indiana Jones movie, James Mangold. And um, he basically started responding to my tweets because from what I've been able to gather, he mistakenly believed I was a journalist spreading clickbait uh, in order to propagate false information. And so he was coming at me pretty hard because he thought I was like a, one of these like clickbait journalists who, you know, try to take advantage of, of, um, of clickbait in order to get people to visit their site and make money off it and stuff like you that. Got, yeah. We got this covered. <laughs> yeah. And what's funny yeah. is right in your, your uh, description, as we can see on screen there, it doesn't say anything about that really. It just says that you tweet about news, opinions, movies, entertainment, pop culture, following. So, so yeah, from, yeah. <laughs> from, from what I've been able to gather is that he was, someone sent him a link to a news site or a, a website that featured my tweet on it. And so he thought that I was the one who wrote the article and he went, be. went to my tweet and started responding to it. According to him, like uh, he, he never I specified that's cover what, story. But. Well, he never, yeah, he never specified what site uh, he got the link from. I didn't tag anyone in my tweet. I didn't uh, link to anything in my tweet. It's just a gif of, you know, Justin Timberlake, as you can see. Um, and that was, I mean, what you see on the screen is literally like what I put out. So like, I wasn't trying to bait anyone. I wasn't trying to get any attention. Uh, I wasn't trying to bash him directly. I didn't, e I didn't even, like I said, I didn't even know that he was involved in the, in the movie when I made this tweet. So it was just like one of the, those offhanded things. And, and those are the ones that tend to blow up for some reason, because it was the same story with Birds of Prey where I just made a, a comment on the marketing for the film and all of a sudden it became a over 600,000 engagement tweet <laughs> overnight pretty much. Um, so like, it was kind of the same thing with this. And I was just like, I thought that maybe he'd tweet at me like one or two times, but he did it for 12 hours straight. He yeah, was, he went nuts. He was just doing these tweet storms um, and and he was he was being like pretty insulting in a very condescending way uh, towards me, towards my podcast co-hosts. And, uh, and you know, it, it's, it, we've kind of made a joke out of it, but at the same time, I'm like, you know, this is a multi-millionaire uh, Hollywood director who is punching down on a group of people who do a podcast from my dining room. You know, can I posit something? Because uh, I, I'm not so sure he saw this on any like other like news site or anything because I went looking for it and until after it blew up. I couldn't find it any anywhere prior. Uh, truth be told, I think he was just searching hashtag Indiana Jones five and he came across your tweet and he decided uh, probably along with several other fans that just didn't really get as amplified and he just decided to spurg out on you and I think that was his cover story. Again, I'm saying I think this is me just speculating here. But, I mean, look at the week he's had. The movie's been leaking like a sieve. Every day there's been photos leaking out. Uh, there, there was a back, you know, a bunch of background on the movie has been leaking out here and there. Uh, uh, supposedly the title leaked out, but he's been denying that. I mean, he's been acting like such a child about this thing. I'm, it makes me wonder if something happened behind the scenes this weekend. 
Because actually, what would he be doing on a Sunday? Why is he sitting on fucking Twitter when I, he just started filming a movie? I actually just think it's his ego. Like, um, could be, but he's there, old there, there was Hollywood. A, so there was, there was a movie that he made a while back called Kate and Leopold with Hugh Jackman and Meg Ryan. And I can remember back when that came out, I, I watched a behind the scenes thing uh, on HBO about it. And there's a scene in there where a uh, young Alfrey Woodward, Woodard, who before she became like a big actress, she was playing this this police woman who tickets uh, Leopold for letting his dog poop on the sidewalk. And there was a behind the scenes shot of Mangold directing that scene and Alfrey Woodward kept messing up and he and Mangold kept getting frustrated. And the more he got frustrated, the more she started messing up because he was like making her nervous. And I was watching this on the behind the scenes thing. And I was like, this director is being a total dick. Like, like, you know, like, why are they showing this in a behind the scenes thing? It's not very flattering. I tried to look for it on YouTube. I couldn't find it, but I, I remember it very vividly because like, I was just surprised at how big of a jerk uh, that this director was being in it. And, and, you know, a little bit in his defense, in my experience in Hollywood, the biggest jerks tend to be the, the best creative people in terms of like, you know, their output. So it's not unusual to find like a real dickhead who is someone who works in Hollywood, who's actually a very good like filmmaker or storyteller or what have you. Um, but it, it's just emblematic of what I saw yesterday, which is like, yeah, he's kind of a dick, but that doesn't mean he's untalented. Indeed. Well, here's the thing that's funny um, is he's not like one of the younger guys like that we see in Hollywood nowadays. That's the thing is he's a veteran, and that's what I was getting at is honestly he could have – this could have been a non-issue. All he had to say was, yeah, I know Steven Spielberg's not directing. I'd be apprehensive of an Indiana Jones film without him directing, but I'm directing it, and I'm a huge fan. Give me a shot. You never know. Sure, Kathy is producing. I don't understand why that's a problem. Yeah, Harrison Ford's this old, but would, would you want anybody else other than Indiana Jones? And by the way, no, Jonathan Kasdan isn't writing. Yeah, yeah that's all he had to Dr. say. Doctor also made that made that point. But before any of that happened, as you mentioned, uh, Matt, he uh, he thought that you were a journalist, and once it became clear that you, that you had like your own little uh, podcast, then of course he attacked that, and he attacked your co-hosts. Uh, obviously thinking you did this for clickbait. So let's make it a little bit clickbaity by talking about your podcast, The Salty Nerd, and bring up your uh, your fellow yeah. co-conspirator, my, my, Matt my, uh, Welcome. My bar barbarian space viking himself, Matt How Peterson. you doing, sir? Matthew, what did you do? <laughs> I swear, buddy. Uh, Gentlemen, script, how is everybody? Chat? Honestly, nice here. I, welcome, sir. I would say this is not even as bad as the uh, Birds of Prey one, to be honest no, with you. No, but the I mean, Birds of Prey, the Birds of Prey thing was just a bunch of Spurgeon SJWs. This is this is the director of the movie, man. He's he's crazy. Well, and that, even the tweet itself is what I'm saying. Like, yeah, the tweet itself. Like, at least here he wasn't like giving. Like to me, it felt like the the Birds of Prey thing. Oh yeah, I knew that was going to get some heat. Mm -hmm. This, I'm like, why Why is he doing this? Like, any normal director would be like, you know, just just please give me a chance and wait and see. No, instead he's like, fuck you and fuck your points and fuck everything. And <laughs> well, you're, fucking, you, you know, you know what, just going on. What, what happened here, so basically he came out firing. His very first reply was he called me a basement dweller, basically. And our other co-host, the host of the Solid Nerd podcast, Alex, um, you know, he's very diplomatic. He doesn't like drama. So like he tweeted out to James Mangold. He's like, hey, you know, uh, we do this from our awesome studio with our Batman statue. And he put like a picture of us, you know, doing the podcast in, in my home studio. And uh, it's just it was a very innocent picture. He was just kind of like being like, hey, we like to talk about movies like whatever. He, That's not, what nothing, do. nothing insulting at all. And then Mangold comes in and starts bashing our home studio, uh, talking about uh, our Batman statue. My my girlfriend has a jar of corks uh, that was in the background that, like, every time she kills a bottle of wine, she collects the cork. And um, so he was just being really condescending, kind of bashing our little uh, home studio YouTube production thing. And that's when, you know, Alex and Vader kind of got involved in, uh, <laughs> in the whole uh, drama. Yeah, I let my fingers do some uh, talking <laughs> at that. But I, I was very nice. I didn't get, like, super mean or nothing. And I, I, I can get mean. But, uh, yeah, he was just a punching down jerk, man. I, I, I'm i shocked. I, I was, it was wild. Yeah. yeah we, we, it's like a nice man. jar of corks, buddy. It's really. Yeah, you're, we're, we're going we're, we're to fe feature that jar in our next episode. But uh, the, the, the idea that a guy who runs a $100 million 
uh, movie set, you know, thinks that these guys who whose full time job is not making YouTube content. It's just something we do for fun. And we have a little studio set up in my home. It, it's like that's something that needs to be shit on because it's, it's yeah. beneath them. I mean, that's just emblematic of Hollywood elitists. It's actually a very nice little studio you've set up. Yeah. I think so, it's, it's, but it's certainly not. You it's know, not up to Mangold standards. No, I mean it's it's not like I'm talking into a microphone on a webcam. It's it's a very professional setup. It's awesome, and we're lucky to have Matt do that for us for the podcast. It's it's a really nice thing to do. So it yeah, makes it fun. He, and he was even able to to uh, to offend the vinyl tiles. So that's like classy, <laughs> classy, classy for a big time Hollywood director. Uh, you know what that reminds me of? Because, um, well, actually, before we before we get into what it reminds me of, script, uh, you also had a great tweet there uh, about uh, how he could have responded. Uh, do, do you have that for us there? Let's see if I can bring it up. I retweeted it here because I thought it was... Uh, That's the thing. He was, was so tweeting, for, like Matt had said, for like almost 12 hours. So to go through all this is crazy. And then he starts deleting some of them. Oh, I think I found script doctors. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if we can bring it up on screen, otherwise I have it here. Yeah, like, like right. he went off on like a tr anti-Trump tangent for a while. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I was like, the fuck you and the fuck. It's like, what in the fuck is this guy doing? <laughs> uh, so here's Script's uh, tweet there. Yeah, Script, do you want to read it? Uh, sure. So, um, okay. Uh, yeah, I got to bring up on my side because Tom. Yeah, this is pretty much it. what I was saying earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so, I can read it then in the meantime. Oh, I, I got it right here. So, okay, perfect. How creatives should address concerned fans with reservations? Your doubts are understandable. My goal is to tell a great new story fans will love as well as a new audience and leave them wanting more. I want this to be fun for everyone, and I'm not looking to disappoint them. Well, See he, there? That's how difficult it was. That's uh, that's the exactly. right way to answer. You, you know yeah. what's weird about this whole situation, though, is like my tweet, Mangold took it number one, as a personal attack, and number two, as spreading uh, lies and, and fake news about the movie. About and, and and so many people were like, you know, like, how dare you, like, attack this movie you haven't seen? I'm like, I didn't say anything about the story. I didn't say anything about what the movie could be about. I simply said Steven Spielberg's not directing it. Kathleen Kennedy is producing it. Um, Harrison Ford is 78. And that that was their big argument that I was an ageist. And, and so like Mangold personally felt like I was attacking Harrison Ford. I was like, he's literally 78 years old. You know, um, the only thing I got wrong over at this point. Yeah, yeah the, the only thing I got wrong was that um, John Jonathan um, Kasdan wasn't writing yeah. the movie. Um, but Last I heard, you know, he had done work on on the movie before Mangold came on. And I guess like threw that out the window. He did. No, he was. Well, the, and like I said, I wasn't even aware. I knew Mangold, and when I said that earlier, the only reason I remember that specifically is because I've been making the joke for a while: is they're going to kill Indy because, because it's a guy who killed Logan. So that's why. Like, why else would you bring Mangold in? But no, I get it. He's a veteran director. He's a great director. Well, I, I think that they brought him in because he had a deal with Fox, and when Disney could bought very Fox. Well be his deal probably transferred over to them and they're like, what do we do with this guy? <laughs> the other side of it is, is he denies having any connection with a Boba Fett movie, but that was a huge thing for a while that he was attached to a Boba Fett movie. And then all of a sudden he wasn't and he didn't seem to have a falling out with them. So maybe this was just a gimme make makeup kind of deal. Um, maybe Spielberg picked him. I, I think that that's the more likely scenario is Spielberg kind of like handed it off to him. Um, because I don't see Kathleen Kennedy making uh, a, a choice like that. She'd want a, a younger, more inexperienced director she could con control. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. And you're right, because like this just for some reason the, the 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 well, I'll let you guys discuss it because you know you're in the midst of it all. But like I just don't understand the behavior here from a veteran director. Like like I said, he's taking like the playbook right from you know Feige. Uh, uh, and or not Feige, but Feig and uh, oh, Feig. yeah, yeah, and Josh Trank, Josh Trank, and Ryan mostly, Johnson, mostly Josh and, yeah. Trank, because like the, honestly, this is like the worst thing I've seen since Josh Trank. Josh Trank was like the one that tweeted out, apparently, I have to say, tweeted out, uh, or is rumored to have tweeted out a picture of his dog's butthole <laughs> with this is what I think of you fans criticizing my movie. And and then his Twitter account disappeared real real fast after that. And then apparently he also like 
went on like another uh it wasn't reddit yeah he also had like a reddit meltdown with someone that claimed to be him and then later it was uh who was it the, the guy who did um, a latino review i forget his name right now anyway real real prolific influencer and uh, and pundit oh, what's his name Worked loads with John Campion and stuff. But anyway, he also said, like, Josh Trank Don lost his mind. And <laughs> the, the, this reminds me of that, honestly, because here you have a director uh, of, a, of a hundred million dollar plus mega blockbuster worldwide feature film, and he spends a full day. Now, granted, Sunday, so I guess that we can imagine. It's probably his own free uh, free time, but still, yeah. he spent the entire <laughs> freaking day going after fans on Twitter and insulting the entire audience in every single way possible. I don't, you know, I don't I think, think I don't think you guys understand the importance of having me and Matt Vader on your show because. <laughs> We run the most influential podcast at Lucasfilm right now. Well, you got you the band. Every, got everyone the corks, everyone cares about what we think. You have the corks, man. <laughs> it's all about the corks, baby. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe you know, it, yeah. It, it, to me, it's showing just as insecure as Trank was, as Feig was, as Johnson was, and, and Tim Miller to an extent. It's just showing the same kind of shit, and then Elizabeth Banks as well with Charlie's Angels, and then who was the one that directed Birds of Prey? I can't remember her name. Uh, Kathy Ann, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. it's all the yeah. same playbook, and and yeah. and and he went through the entire playbook yesterday. He went from attacking you personally, calling you a basement dweller, and all that shit, to attacking you as some kind of Trump supporter. Even though, honestly, I mean. I, I couldn't really see anything on your main page right away to really say that, but hey, he just went after you and just decided, you know, like when uh, fucking Feig went out and said, anybody who doesn't like Ghostbusters 2016 is a fucking Trump supporter. Yeah, th this yeah. really reminded me <laughs> of, of, of the Paul to, to be fair though, To be fair, though, it wasn't it wasn't Feig that said that. That was, okay. the, that was the guy who did Freaks and Geeks. He was the one, uh, what's his name again? The Freaks and Geeks guy. Uh, so, Seth Rogen? No, no not, not Seth, Seth Rogen. Rogen the other one. The one who uh, uh, I can't think of his name. He's annoying as piss. Yeah, I used to like him, but... but anyway, yeah, he Jason was the Siegel? one that said. J Judd Apatow? No, uh, no, no, Apatow, no, no, thank you. Yes, Apatow. Yeah, yes, Apatow. It was him. He was oh. he was the one who first basically said that the people who don't like everything about this new Ghostbusters thing, they're probably Trump supporters. He was the one that started that. So let's have that thing. Also, Stephen Otten says for five bucks, Andre, I agree. I was also reminded of Josh Trank. I feel like we're right back where we started. And uh, yeah, kind of is. But you know, this also reminds me of, and I want your thoughts on this. If we think back to Tim Miller during yeah. the production and marketing of Terminator Woke Fate, or Dark Fate, as I believe the technical the title was. is going to scare the shit out of you. Exactly. And that one sentence, that one sentence that he put out, not directly to any fans, but it was still attacking the fans, where he said, like, this woman, she's so amazing, and she's going to scare the crap out of every misogynist little basement-dwelling fanboy. That's what it was, yeah. To that effect. You, you would think and that these that, guys would learn. Yeah, <laughs> and that one statement, that one statement can follow the movie all the way up unto its release. I'm not saying that the movie bombed because of that statement, but he lost the fan base in that moment. That's the moment when the fans were out, and they yeah. never came back again. And that was my point when I said, you know, it's guys like Matt that people even know who Mangold is or that he directed Logan or any of that shit, and a lot of people took me to task for that i'm like no if you understand what i'm getting at is general audiences don't give a shit and, and half the nerds don't realize what who's doing what like there's still people who think that steven spielberg directs the jurassic films for fuck's sake <laughs> i mean they have they're just they don't care they only know of a certain director a director to them is kind of fugazi like they see an actor you know they don't they don't normally see directors so unless they're somebody like tarantino they just don't really exist to them and i can tell you James Mangold is not somebody who's on the lips of every fucking person in the world. Yeah, have... and also, <laughs> like, I have experience working in Hollywood, so I've been in many situations where I've gotten into arguments with 
directors, producers, other writers, stuff like that. I'm sure Script Doctor can relate. Oh, we're yeah. like, we're like, <laughs> you know, these are just most of the time they're just they're either very egotistical or they are so passionate about their stance that they're unwilling to back down. And so you have these kerfluffles. It's not something that's unusual to kind of have a back and forth between someone like a James Manigold and people who are forcing him to justify his decisions. But I'd be interested to hear Matt Vader's thoughts as an outsider, because we on our podcast, we have this good dynamic where he doesn't care. He just wants to shut his brain off and watch a movie. And I'm sitting here analyzing every little thing. Uh, I'm the popcorn guy. Matt's yeah. so laid back. <laughs> the other guy. Yeah, Matt V. Entertain my eyes and my ears. And I'm usually happy with the movie. But man, this this thing, you know, Mangold's made some good movies. We I've, I've looked at his list. I've seen most some of them. Great movies, actually. And I was completely entertained by most of the ones that I've seen in his, especially the, the Logan and Wolverines. But, you know, when these guys punch down like he did, you know, I'm just a fan. And now I'm questioning whether I even want to see Indy 5 at this point, you know, and I think that's what people in our circle and community are going to be like. We're, we're going to judge this guy now. He's, he's a dick. You know, he, he doesn't like people to watch his movies, apparently. And um, that's hard for me to say because Matt knows Indy, Indiana Jones is my jam. It's above Star Wars for me. It's like Raiders of the Lost Ark is like my perfect movie since I was 12 years old. Yeah, Vader only has two and, five star movies. And, <laughs> and, uh, and Raiders, Raiders is one of them. them. Yeah. And then there's the second one and the third one and the one we don't talk about. But, um, you know, this is, I don't know why any director would even bother spending a day on Twitter when he has, you know, other be, things. Because other my, things. Opinion, my opinion is important, well, Matt. I'd be more concerned about whether uh, Harrison Ford could chew his food or not. <laughs> so, you know see, what? See, see, Vader, because he does a, a weekly podcast with me, he's not used to how important my opinion is <laughs> and how much water it carries in Hollywood. So <laughs> well, you are you know the end all be all. You even you even st stirred up Scotty Mendelson of all. People. I know, right? Yeah. It's, it's Mr. Mendelson uh, picked up on this, and you know oh, who else? Yeah. Uh, Matt Jarbo. He did, he did a, a, oh. a video <laughs> defending uh, Mr. Mangold and and calling me a basement dweller. Did he really? I always I always find it funny how people insert themselves into these conversations. It's just That's so many insert themselves. Yeah. Like, there's been yeah. a few others, but I'm not going to. Yeah. But, 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 yeah. but, the, but the biggest one, though, of course, is uh, is our good Forbes contributor, and I call mm. him contributor because he's not really a Forbes journalist. Got a Scotty. I th that was so funny that because that's like all the people that that uh, that get involved. And here's like the thing that, the thing that I find funny with this. But uh, Mendelssohn, he probably obviously just wanted to score some brownie points. You think so, or did like he get that, a phone but, call or a text from uh, Mangold? Do you think? I don't think so, honestly. Well, may, maybe he got one from Mangold, but he didn't get one from Disney or Lucasfilm. No, That's for yeah. damn certain, because all he did was just disseminate the drama even further. And you can see from the final statement from Mangold, the very final say, one, we'll yeah. get into that. That's when he got the phone call. Yeah, and that was my question here, because look, I, this is the one time in a while you're going to probably hear anything me, me say anything good for Kevin Smith until well after He-Man comes out, so get ready for this. He needs to take a note from Kevin Smith. Stay the fuck off the internet. Start editing your movie on your day off. That's what Kevin Smith does. That's why his movies get done so quickly. And he cries. For, yeah, first, first day off, he, all he does is go through everything that he shot that week, and he starts cutting instantly. Some nights he does it on the first night. That's what Mangold should be doing right now, going through every inch of footage he got and not worrying about what the fucking internet's saying, not worrying about the rest of the world. Instead, he's making it look really bad. But I know we got these gentlemen for a short period, so let's get through uh, the rest of this here. Yeah, let's... Uh, let's. Um, were, were there any other like really specific comments that he made that, uh, that you guys would like to address before well, I, the I final mean, one? It was kind of funny because uh, when he went off on the anti-Trump uh, stuff, he posted an image uh, where he listed... It was like an image of all the stuff that Trump has gotten right and has proven to have gotten right since he left office. And then he had rebuttals in there. And one of them was the defense of critical race theory. And, and basically, for those of you who don't know, critical race theory is basically the theory that 
racism is institutionalized. So every white person is racist, every court is racist, every company is racist, and they need to constantly be making up for this racism. And uh, I, I just put out a tweet that said like, uh, a rich white guy who works in a white dominated industry, who is making a movie about a, a straight white man, um, defends and promotes critical race theory. Uh, keep fighting the power, bro. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that was the, the tweet that he deleted because he was getting a lot of pushback on that. Uh, so like, you, you know, that, that kind of ended the political aspect of things, but after he deleted that tweet, a lot of his followers start calling us like far right wingers and, and, you know, like, uh, the right wing conspiracy and, you know, the Trump supporters and stuff like that. And that well, was that's like, just an easy way to get a tide of people coming after you real quick. Yeah. And you know, what's, what was interesting about this is that, um, when the birds of prey thing happened, those were like hardcore, like track them down your home and kill you SJWs who yeah. were after me. Um, with this, it, it's, it just seemed more like they were just fans of this director and yeah, like they don't understand a lot about movies. They think Kathleen Kennedy actually, you know, was responsible for making the movie she produced good. Um, <laughs> uh, a lot of last Jedi defenders and stuff like that. Um, but they just seemed like, like fans of, of Mangold and his movies. And so they were coming out to support him and, and defend his position and stuff like that. Um, so like, it wasn't really too mean spirited. I mean, I did get a couple of nasty private DMS from randos, but, uh, by and large, it was like nothing compared to the, the birds of prey thing. And so it was just kind of like a interesting thing where everyone started jumping in and, and tweeting at him and he started tweeting back and, and, uh, Vader, did he respond to any of your stuff? No, I, I know you tweeted at him a couple of times. I, I know Alex did too. And I think Alex got a few responses. No, I, th yeah. I think he was pretty hyper-focused on you. But I yeah, was, I, was, I was I was playing too nice yesterday. I think that's I mean. the thing that's funny about this is I mean, there's people who even accused you of doing this on purpose, like you had planned. Like Mangold was gonna, like in what world? Yeah, exactly. I am like, an evil genius. <laughs> you, you you post stuff almost every. I wouldn't say every day, but you post stuff all the time, kind of like this. This is nothing new out of you. I, I, I mean, actually, I'll go back to this one super chat here. Um, Mr. Tickle Trunk says, how did you guys get the infamous salty nerds, the arbiters of truth on the show? They're so big. Hollywood directors address them directly. Well, actually, I've known Matt personally for over two years or almost two years now. Right. And you I know, think more. I think more you know than that. I think three actually years. three years. I was going to say I'm trying to figure we lost a year. I forget that <laughs> sometimes. So like, yeah. And Matt's been on quite a few times and we've been trying to get him on the morning show. So basically, I know that I guess that's the key is he's just got to shake a director and we'll get, we can get him on the show that it's not our choice. It was his, I've been trying to get him on the morning show for weeks now. So, <laughs> well, you, you know, the for biggest months. thing to come out of this is that yesterday, Jeremy from geeks and gamers made a video where he admitted I was right. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that to me was bigger than Mangold because for four it is years, true. Like, like it took him four years to finally admit it. But he finally came out and said, Matt Kadosh was right about Kathleen Kennedy. I was wrong. And and I did a stream with him yesterday where I kind of ribbed him on that. I, I was like, oh, it took you four years, but eventually I'm always proven right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Win, win oh, yeah. out in the end. Uh, but, That's right. Uh, I remember. I, now I forgot that the first time I saw yeah. you was on that video with Jeremy. Yeah. yeah. yeah no, I, I, was the only, I was the only person there saying Kathleen Kennedy was not getting That's fired. right. Yeah, you were She's getting not just going anywhere. And they were all we digging were into me. The shit out of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, 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 but Matt you, Vader, uh, I know that you have to you have to leave us. Yes. Uh, so well, check out the salty nerd, I, pod, uh, salty, salty nerd podcast if I could talk. Yeah, the link is yeah. in the description. Yeah, we. Uh, so if you're on Apple Podcast, if you're on Spotify, we have our audio only versions up on there. Pretty much anywhere podcast you you can listen to them. But we're also really doing a lot on YouTube, where we're trying to be like the Tim Pool of movie review shows, where you know we we sit there, we videotape ourselves talking about movies. We have a, a big like kind of like talk show format almost. And uh, it's a lot of fun. We got a lot of different perspectives. Yeah. My, my girlfriend's on there. She's crazy. Uh, Vader's super salty. Alex keeps things moving. Um, it's a lot of fun. I, I, like, I like to dress up sometimes. So, you know. Yeah, he likes to cosplay. Um, but uh, if you go to saltynerdvideo.com, that'll take you right to our YouTube channel. And you can check out our content and subscribe if you like it. We're really trying to 
you know, try and get to, get to the point where we can do this full time so Vader can quit his job and, uh, you know, just be salty 24 uh, 7. And, salty 24 uh, 7, yes. Yeah. And uh, with, with your guys' help and support, uh, we, we're getting closer and closer to that goal. So we really appreciate any support you can give us. I'd like to retire to do something I enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So any fan of uh, James Mangold should take his endorsement seriously and go check out the Salty Nerd podcast. I mean, they obviously have Hollywood's attention. Obviously. Yeah, and, and yeah. if you can't follow that big, complicated link, just go to saltynerdvideo.com. takes you right to our YouTube page. Yep. All right, excellent. Well, with that, uh, Vader, uh, you have to be leaving us, so thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks. Matt, as in Take care, buddy. do you have a few more minutes or do you yeah, have to yeah, leave as I, well? No, I can stick around for a bit. Yeah, let's try okay. and knock out some of these cool. super chats that are addressed at you and the situation. Yes, indeed. Let's uh, do that. We can start with the ones that we can bring up on screen right away. Uh, Drew with Comics Elite says, as soon as Mangold responded, he lost his argument. Yeah. Well, he shouldn't even have said anything to begin with. No, exactly. Here's like the thing that that people like, what well, really anyone that's in the position where they run anything, they have to understand that you don't always have to respond. I mean, if that an accusation is completely freaking ridiculous, you don't have to respond. Like, there's no reason. Like, you're above it. You don't have to go down to that level. In this well, case, there was you weren't. He wasn't even called out. Yeah, you, you know, it's funny. It, if you look at my original post, what did I say that was an attack necessarily? Yeah, you just Steven hashtag Spiel Indiana Jones. Stupid fight. facts. Yeah. Steven Mostly. Spielberg's not directing. Kathleen Kennedy is producing. Harrison Ford's seventy-eight years old. <laughs> the only thing I got wrong was that uh, apparently Jonathan Kasdan isn't didn't write the script. So. But uh, you could you could st say that, that that's a good thing I got that wrong. <laughs> so, He's still okay. listed yeah, on he IMDb though. To still, that. well, the other part too is like I mean, you said for, you were presenting like if anyone thinks that this is going to be good, these are the things to consider because you're showing examples of a pattern we've seen with a couple yeah. other franchises. I mean, that's quite justifiable. However, like Mangled had a perfect op opportunity to dissuade you from that, and instead went the exact opposite direction. Yeah, he, he should have gone Trevorrow, and instead he went full Johnson. Agreed. So. Agreed, 110%. Because I was trying to find that, because I could have swore Trevorrow actually even apologized for last Jurassic film. And he was like, yeah, I was distracted with things, which we know what he was distracted with or whatever. Yeah, I was well, trying he, to find that. Tre Trevorrow is humble. Like, exactly. He's someone, like, like he's, he's someone who he, he's like, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm flawed. I don't always do the right thing, but you know, I care about you guys and I want to entertain you guys. And so, you know, contrast that with like, my shit don't stink. I know what's better. I'm better than you, you know, take what I give you and like it. Like that's kind of man, the Mangold Johnson um, kind of mentality. And this whole thing really did remind me of the Paul Feige or Paul Feig. I pronounce his name. I uh, big, yeah. Situation yeah. where we're it's, basically it's not with an A, even though many are tempted to think that. But it's yeah. yeah. But but basically, he yeah. made a movie that he knew was going to bomb, and he was afraid it was going to bomb, and so he went full attack on the critics, trying to make it seem like they were sexist misogynists instead of ha actual fans that had legitimate gripes. Right. And and he just came out swinging, and, and that narrative didn't stop until the movie left theaters after it had tanked. And, and so, you know, this playbook has been tried before and it's failed every time it's been tried. Uh, and I don't understand, I, I guess like maybe he doesn't follow this stuff or he doesn't care about it or whatever. He thinks that he's above it all. He does seem like an elitist. He does seem like someone yeah. who, whose ego about himself is so big that he just looks down upon other people. And so like, I think a lot of that is what drove yesterday's Spurg out was like, he, he was like, I'm gonna set the record straight. People are gonna listen to me because I'm important. And uh, his attacks were very subtle. In fact, he kind of changed his strategy later on in the day where at first he was being kind of like very snarky and, and insulting. And then he got to the point where he was like, you know, maybe this isn't coming off right. So he tried to make it seem like he was being nice while he was still being very, um, I don't know what the word would be, um, kind of dismissive or pass aggressive, I guess. Patronizing. Uh, patronizing. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you are the, the script. Kind of like he got poked a little bit. 
Well, I, I, I think he, he, he saw some of the criticisms and, and yeah. he was like, he was like, okay, I'm not coming off well. So he started doing what looked like the Trevorrow. I don't um, think he's self-aware enough. Somebody told him. Yeah. Well, he started doing what looked like the Trevorrow strategy where he's like, okay, you fans tell me, you know, what you want to see. But then like, if you really read the tweets, it's, it's like, he's putting fans in condescending. Marks. Yeah. Very condescending stuff. Um, but uh, he did kind of sh shift strategy midway through the day after a lot of this stuff kind of didn't go so well for him. Yeah, and then he went and I, I don't I didn't I can't even remember what he said in the one tweet. I think it was either early this morning or late last night where he kind of tried to squash the whole thing. It seemed like or like where Andre was saying earlier, we were pretty sure somebody from Disney said called him and said, "What the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> I, 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 I kind of kind of doubt that. I kind of yeah. doubt it actually. Yeah, I don't. To think a point, any, I don't know because I, I don't think anyone called him. I think that this was something that was going on that was under the radar of a lot of people outside of the Twitter sphere. Well, here's the thing: is the flying monkeys came out last night, um, and these are the same flying monkeys that come out when anything Lucasfilm, mainly Star Wars, is involved, right? But here's the thing that you pointed out, guys, earlier that I noticed is it's not as ferocious because they don't have as much to hang on to here as they did with Star Wars. With Star Wars, they had the Ray thing. They had other things. You had Ray Lowe's involved in well. So you had a lot of other people. I think, like, you know, the other Matt and you, and we all kind of got to right away. Indy's a little different than Star Wars, right? I mean, it's just as popular almost, and it's definitely Lucasfilm's second, you know, golden goose. But it is much more male-driven. Well, you, you know what was interesting about this thing is that a lot of the attacks, a lot of the the defenses of Mangold's position are the exact same playbook that you see for Last Jedi Defenders, exactly. for Bird, Birds of Prey Defenders. They come out. It's like how you can't criticize a movie you haven't seen. Uh, they they use my profile picture as as proof that like I'm stupid or something well, like that. Uh, I, I, I think you were off uh, getting a drink or something when I was talking to the other Matt before the show, and I said it's funny because this is like the book that was written by Josh Trank with forward by Ryan Johnson and epilogue by fucking Tim Miller. Yeah. It's like, we're yeah, go ahead. Sorry. They, they, they call you some type of ist. So sexist, misogynist, ageist was the one for this one. Although I don't think that carries as much weight as some of these other things. It's, it's um, funny. You just merely referenced his age, which is very, I, I very merely true. stated how old he was. Yeah. And it, was it, no it, more that made that. me ageist. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's kind of funny because they kept saying they kept showing pictures of Harrison Ford riding a bike and saying like he's in great shape for his age. And I'm like, if you have to append for his age to any statement, uh, that means he's too old. <laughs> See, that's another good you thing know? you brought up that because I was curious for a moment there. I'm like, with all those photos that were leaking out, I'm like, this seems like too many for it to be like somebody on the set or some paparazzi like this feels like it was these are meant to be coming out on purpose to get some kind of buzz going and i don't think it got the buzz going that they wanted and i think maybe that's where mangold started lashing out at people like you matt they, i maybe, could be wrong but like like my point about, my point about harrison ford's age it's not that i don't like dislike harrison ford I, I love him as an actor no but he's getting to the point where by we're getting to the point where indiana jones would actually be in the movie like the year the movie Raiders of the Year Lost yeah, Lost like, Art like, came out, like, <laughs> like, like, like the the point is is like whether the audience will be able to suspend their disbelief enough to believe that a man who looks as old as Harrison Ford can be taken punches from Nazis, can be dragged behind a, a car, you know, all this other stuff. And, Ma yeah. and Mangold never really did anything to kind of assuage those fears. He kept saying like, if if I let anything leak, uh, you know, the rest of it will leak. And and so he was trying to defend his position without really saying anything that could defend his position, which was a little bit strange um, in, in my opinion, but the whole Aegis argument just kind of came out of nowhere because my whole thing is like, I don't care that Harrison Ford's 78 years old. Like he's, he's still a great actor. I care about, because when uh, Crystal Skull came out, like he was like, what, 65? And that yeah. was push, pushing it for believability in that movie. Um, and, and with the set photos that came out now, he just looks so old and haggard that it, it makes it, like he looks like grandpa. Like if he broke his hip and slipping in the tub, how is he going to take a punch from a Nazi? <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it, it, it's a suspension of disbelief thing. And that's what I'm most worried about is when I go to see this movie and I will go see it. Um, if, if seeing him do, it was almost like watching Patrick Stewart do yeah. the action scenes in Picard. It was oh, just gosh. so unbelievable. Yeah. You know, like he's such a frail old man that like when he gets thrown back 50 feet from an explosion, you're like, that would kill him. 
that would literally kill the guy. Right. You know, so well, like. It, no, I was just going to say, that's what reminded me of those arguments when we would bring that up. Oh, your age is like, oh, fuck you. You're the first time you ever care about anybody's age. Because any other time it's, we don't care what 40-year-old white dudes or old white dudes are doing. Or you're trying to tear down old white dudes or kill them all. The only time they even give a shit about anybody being ageist or anything like that is when it just, it, 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 it has anything to do with what they are trying to defend. That's yeah, the only I, time I, they give a shit. So I, that argument think, to me is... I also think Mangold thought that me saying that Spielberg was not directing the movie was like a personal attack against him. Even though when I wrote that, I, I didn't know who was actually directing the movie. I had forgotten it. Um, so uh, I don't think that he would be any less insulted if he knew that. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it was obvious I touched a nerve. And he actually thought or believed that like I was like some type of journalist who was spreading fake news. And uh, it, it was weird because like he kept accusing me of, of, of clickbait, which his followers uh, kind of jumped on. And I, I was like, I didn't link to anything in my in my tweet. I didn't tag anyone in my tweet. I didn't post it anywhere except my private Twitter timeline. I mean, it's public, but I mean, it's it's my timeline. And so like I literally did nothing, which is why I'm so influential in Hollywood, because everyone hangs on my Twitter feed wanting to know what I think about stuff. <laughs> Yeah, we have the Kadish scale. We get the alert yes. of it every morning. Yes, everyone cares what I think. And so well, I, I, I'm, I'm a mover and shaker in, in the industry. Well, a lot of the YouTube sphere made a bunch of videos about the leaks and crap. But you're the only one who got singled out. That's the funny thing. And you guys, I've been on your podcast before. It's pretty laid back. You you mainly just talk the news. You don't really get into the gossipy or the rumor stuff yeah, at all. And, 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 you, and you know, we really don't do a whole lot of entertainment news. Like our big thing is is movie uh, reviews, where we pick a theme, like ninja movies, and we'll watch three ninja movies and we'll talk about them. And it's more of a comedy show. It's not really uh, like like we we try to educate, we try to entertain, but it's not really something where we're like, oh, Brie Larson said this, exactly. blah, blah, blah. Like, like we don't get into that stuff. We try to do more evergreen content where you could watch our videos a year from now and, and still find them entertaining instead of being like, oh, that's old news. Uh, so like that's what our focus is on. And my Twitter feed, for whatever reason, just gets a, a lot of attention from people. I, like like you said, a lot of people were doing stuff about Indiana Jones, but I'm the only person, the director and writer responded to so right and that's what i was getting is like didn't go after any of the other youtubers that made videos what yeah i don't even remember you guys making a video so why did he pinpoint you out of everybody i just I because I, i'm super important in the industry tom it's that sexy face uh, yes so yeah let's not for, let's not forget that he actually called you <laughs> yeah out i was gonna say was like, you're Give us your credential so we your can profile oh yeah he, he, he tried terms. to hate me yeah, he yeah. tried to bait me. Uh, so he basically said that, you know, he, like I had mentioned that I had worked in Hollywood and I, I said, anyone who knows anything about Hollywood knows that Kathleen Kennedy did this on these movies instead of this. And so he kind of like threw down the gauntlet and he was like, tell me what your experience is so we can be on equal footing. And I did reply to him. I said, I made a movie with Jeremy Renner. I, I'm not obviously not as successful as you are, but I did work in the industry for like 10 years. And, you know, I yeah. did all this and that. And he didn't respond to that. Like, he just kind of ignored that re reply. And um, I would have liked to have engaged with him. I would have liked for him to have watched my short film that's on YouTube and right. you know, be, be like, you know, I was wrong about you. Let me give you a couple million dollars. Or buy your movie. book or something. <laughs> or, right. or something. Yeah, you know. But Well, um, and I, this is what I was trying to say before what Dr. Coffinil is saying here. Henry Jones was born in 1899. If he were 79 or 80, it would be 1978 or 79. That's what I was saying. He would be it would actually take place now in the year that Raiders of the Lost Start came out. That's where we're at yeah. time-wise, yeah. Yeah, because Raiders came out they're in 81, but too. still. Yeah, and then they're de-aging him on top of it. Yeah, I think so, they're going to have some flashbacks to Nazi I think era. so. Well, so, I heard the problem some with that plot, is that they're so. probably going to use Disney's own proprietary de-aging technique <sighs> instead, instead of, you know... Uh, the the um, what's it? Oh, brain fart. What's it called again? Like the uh, well, well, the deep fake, but they don't deep use faking. It. Yeah, they're they don't use deep well. fake though because no, they have uh, a different uh, technology. Yeah, exactly. They have their own proprietary one, which is shit compared to deep fake. But that's what they're gonna use. So look forward to uh, to robot plastic. Yeah, all that crap looking Indiana Jones. That's gonna be good times. Yeah, it was. I can't remember what it's called either, but I think ILM made it, and they used it for. I think the first time wasn't it in uh, 
Tron, I believe. Tron yeah, Legacy. I think so. Yeah, Tron Legacy, yeah. and then and then they used oh, it again in Avengers. There. It wasn't Civil War. It was the one after that, I think. Yeah, Ant Man. They yep, did use Ant-Man. it in Civil War. Did they use it in Civil War? Which yeah. one was? Yeah, like they DH Tony Stark. Yes, that's the one. Yep, 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 yep. Because it's when he has the the little. Uh, the setup. opening, yeah, but they also used it in Ant Man when they de aged for Michael, Michael Douglas, Do- yeah, which that Michael one didn't Keaton. look as bad. Though. Keaton, yeah. It's the mouth that they didn't nail. That's the big hardest part with these de aging things is that the mouth, but Luke is- Cruz, they haven't improved it at all. Like, that as excited as people got for that, that looked really bad, yeah, it looked painted on. <laughs> well, but anyway, know. I, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Matt. Well, I mean, with Captain Marvel and uh, Samuel L. Jackson, I mean, looked amazing. Well, I mean, for, for Samuel L. Jackson people. hasn't aged really in 40 no. years anyway, so that's True. kind of like... I think most of that was makeup, to be honest with you. I think script's right. I mean, they even tried to do it with... Um, oh, crap, the guy who plays Coulson. I can't remember his name. is escaping me right now. Clark Gregg? Clark, Clark Gregg, Clark yeah. Gregg, yeah. Who, he, again, he also hasn't really aged much in the last 20 years either because he was on a show with Julia Samuel Lee Jackson Clark. hasn't aged in 40, so... Well, I'm sure they're like Patrick Stewart. He's going to go 40 years without aging, but then he's going to make up for all of those 40 <laughs> years in time. Oh, don't remind me of that, because that's all this movie is going to be is Indiana Jones going around. I'm sorry I'm late. I'm sorry I'm old. I'll stay in my lane. It's it's most likely going to have a, a museum. Most likely going to have sorry. a 35-year-old stunt double, you know, in old age makeup and some dots on his face for photo mapping and doing some of the stunts it's just insurance purposes <laughs> yeah well we'll take it from natasha since she, she's a woman and she would know clark Gregg still really looks good and uh yeah samuel jackson's probably a vampire oh by the way uh one thing that we've uh, also needs to be uh to be uh, emphasized uh loki just like a little thing the loki series i forgot to mention this in the recent editorial you should check it out once we're done with this if you haven't seen it yet Loki conclusively confirmed that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is not canon to the MCU because uh, uh, Agent Coulson apparently really, really died, meaning Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. never happened. Well, it already wasn't. Loki timeline. Yeah, as I say, it already wasn't much. It was adjacent, but um, even yeah. within the um, that well, show, he did die and they brought him back. Yeah, so, so like around the time, like after Loki killed him, there was a, a period of time where they were bringing him back to life, so he was still dead. So I don't know how accurate it is to say that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. didn't happen because... Oh, so he was still dead. He was like, I only saw like the first season or the first two seasons, then well, I was well, out. Well, Loki saw him kill Coulson, but then they never said what happened a year or two after words where he's brought back to life and yeah i think it would be like a really weird omission if they say oh by the way he didn't uh, he didn't die and he went on to collect this team or everything it's like it would be really really weird for for owen wilson not to throw that in loki's face well didn't kevin feige basically say that anything that was on television prior to the disney plus shows wasn't canon anyway yeah he did he did and this really proved that but anyway that's just a tangent uh since we uh, since we uh, it somehow came up but uh yeah but yeah, we're about to lose Matt here soon, so we should probably grab as many of these super chats that are probably directed at him before we go, before he goes, yeah. I should say. We got yeah. we got a little more news to go, but yeah. Indeed. And to anyone wondering, we do these super chats out of order. So if you think that we missed yours, we didn't. We just didn't get it to it to it just yet. Uh, and then let's see, we have Super Nate who says, pretty sure Mangold was making fun of my name, LOL. Well, he can suck it. I was Super Nate. Uh, and uh, 200 Watt Studio says, Matt Kadish. What is it with Lucasfilm hiring man babies to direct their films? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a, that's a, a quote that's attributed to you there. That is a direct uh, result of Kathleen Kennedy being in charge. Yep, Not, no one that could challenge her on a uh, logical level or a creative level. If you have an emotional crippling aspect to you, uh, you are prime for Kathleen Kennedy. <laughs> well, well, you know, yeah. Ka- Kathleen Kennedy's MO is she likes to hire directors that are kind of young and up and coming. Uh, she wants to mentor them, kind of shape them, but she also wants to be able to control them. Um, and that's been her MO. And when you get a director like Ron Howard or... Um, uh, James Mangold coming in, they're kind of very well established. So she has less control over what they do 
um, on a day to day basis. And, and so like, she probably doesn't like to hire those types of people because it's just, you know, she, she likes the, the weak inexperienced ones that she can kind of, you know, manipulate. Well, yeah. She, she puts herself in a position where that, that young director needs her if they want to succeed and have a future career. If you've already built your career, you technically don't need Kathleen Kennedy as yeah. much, <laughs> so to speak. Um, Indeed. And uh, then also Drew with Comics Elite says, how long before James Mangold jumps in this chat? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, we, we'd have him on. He's probably yeah. already here. Yeah, like like I should thank James Mangold. He helped me get my He's probably salty, salty Nerd channel monetized like, yesterday. Hello. James, if you're, if you're listening, then, then reach out and we'll uh, send you a link so you can come on. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be most welcome. I would. I would love to have a chat with the guy. I think. It'd oh be yeah, for sure. Here's for the funny sure. thing: is when he was brought on, nobody's made fun of the fact that he was brought on. Everybody was just joking about how long is he going to last before he steps on KK's toes and she shit cans him. Like that's what everybody's been saying. Nobody's been saying anything really negative about him at all. That's what's funny about this whole thing. Yeah, I, like other than Night and Day, I like pretty much all of his movies. Um, so it, it, you know, it was weird kind of him thinking that I was attacking him when I was just basically pointing out some very legitimate concerns about the movie he's making. I can understand as a creative person wanting to defend your, your movie, defend your creative thing. Um, but, uh, I think he went about it the wrong way. Yeah. Like Mr. Trick, we've been praising his history. Like that's the thing. It's like, sure. I've made the jokes. Do you think he's going to last less time than fucking Josh Trank or more time than the Lord and Miller? I mean, yeah, but it had nothing to do with him. It has everything to do with the revolving door of directors that KK has at Lucasfilm. He's already outlasted Colin Trevorrow. Very good yeah. point. True. Indeed. Indeed. Well, they've and, started uh, filming. So like he's, he's on a ticking clock now, you know, <laughs> yeah, they're a couple weeks in, right? Yeah. 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 They got 88 days. Uh, and uh, we only we don't ha only have so long before Matt has to go. Yes. So another I, I, comment I will, referencing him. I, I will say right before you get to yes. that, um, one of the weird things about Mangold's uh, attacks was like he kept saying that uh, I was um, attacking a movie that he hadn't even made yet, and I always find that a weird thing because a lot of his followers kind of jumped on. It. It's like you can't criticize a movie that doesn't exist. But Script Doctor will probably back me up on this, where it's like that movie exists in script form. That movie exists in the form of who you've cast and what locations you you stuff, like who's working on the movie. There's a lot of ways in which a movie can exist. It's just not completed yet. And so the the fact that he was using this like my my movie's not done, so you can't criticize it. It's like well, you you actually can, um, because it does exist in some form or another. It's just that it's not the completed project is not out there yet. And, and so the idea that you can't um, criticize something that you haven't seen, but that you're knowledgeable about, it, 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 it's a little bit odd to me. Well, not just that. It's almost like watching the, you know, you ask the baker to make you some cookies and they grab fish and they grab steak and they grab salt. And you're like, wait, that's not how you make cookies. And you're like, fuck you. I'm the cook. I know what I'm doing. You know, that's basically what it's like here. And it's, wait a minute here. You know, and then the other side of it, it doesn't matter because once we see it and we don't like it, they're just going to say, oh, you instantly went in. You knew you weren't going to like it. And you just hate it because you're an istophobe. So there's no winning with these people on either side of this. So it don't matter. No, but Matthew is correct. Like when you start a production, you, you're you essentially grabbing all the materials that you've already uh, allocated for it. And if some of those materials or those resources don't look up to snuff, that is, has justifiable reservations from anyone that sees it. It's like, hey, that... It's missing something important here. Like, shouldn't we be digging the foundation out before we start building on top of the soil? Like, you know, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, you you can li listen. Everything's subject to criticism. Even like producers, while movies being made, uh, in this point, come in and be like, uh, "We got to do this differently," or "This is not right," or "I'm not spending money on that stupid thing." Like, that's that's a daily aspect of of production. And then there's the post production nightmare as well, where you know, you realize, oh, we got to go back. We have to reshoot something or, you know, uh, uh, some sort of a issue happened with an actor. And they got to correct that or bring them in or cut them out or uh, yeah. or superimpose another act over another actor because we can't get this shot again. It, like, there's a whole slew of things that happen that require criticism and a critique eye in order to make it better. So, yeah, the the hiding behind, oh, I haven't seen it yet or, oh, I'm still making it. It's it's a it's a fallacy. It doesn't it doesn't actually hold water at all because you, you usually people are speaking up more in 
are more inclined to be like, hey, maybe um, your head's not fully in the game here. Maybe I can help you uh, with this. Even if I am a fan or a nobody on the on the street, maybe uh, I have an idea or perspective that you're missing. And, uh, you know, I'm going to volunteer it out there. And it's the responsibility of the person who can either dismiss it and say nothing, which is usually the best course of action, or, you know, maybe it will stimulate an idea, stimulate an idea in which case they should still say nothing and go back to their 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 job and be like, maybe we should you know, explore this avenue that I, that miraculously just popped into my head. I had nothing to do with social media. Indeed. Uh, and then, um, Glenn Byron says, before you have to leave, uh, thanks for the insight. Have enjoyed it. Oh, you're most, uh, most uh, welcome. We have some more super chats. Uh, Tom, I put one in the private chat that's going <laughs> to require some level of innovation. Right. Uh, on sends in five euros. Um, <clears throat> this is Matt Kadish first. It's not directed by Spielberg Mangold. Is that a personal attack or something? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't made for... Oh, wait. It was kind of made for you. Sorry. <laughs> That's kind of how the whole argument went, but it took 12 hours for Mangle to get to that point. He, he eventually ended up apologizing to me. That's what I'm saying. Like, it... <laughs> Yeah, and I think that uh, when he suddenly, that after going off for 12 hours, having a complete, I don't want to use the word sp- Berg out because I feel like that's probably like racist towards anyone nah, that actually has nah. Asperger's. But <laughs> but basically, then he, yeah. he he completely went on and he had a meltdown. We can say meltdown because that's not racist towards Chernobyl. That's better. So he yeah. had a, he had a complete meltdown, mostly against you. Like you were top of his shit list for a good twelve hours there, and then yeah, all of a sudden he apologized. Because I submit. He got the stone talking to from someone at Disney. Script doctor, uh, is my submission correct? Or could he, out of the goodness of his own heart, have decided that, what am I doing? I'm above this. I have to I have to apologize and move on from this. W- which of those two scenarios is more likely, script doctor? Well, there might also be a third scenario where he was um, on something during the time he started. And then yeah, I was going to say, that down. would really be a trank out if yeah, that's true. Yeah, the booze finally wore off. Um, that's what there. happened to Trank. So, yeah. but, no, but, it, but, it's so weird. I, I just want to say that, like, I am a huge Indiana Jones fan. And, and there are segments of fandom that care about the stuff that they're a fan of so much that they want to protect it. And when they see stuff that is troubling they will criticize it. Being critical is not a bad thing. It's actually something that fans do to protect the things that they love. And just blindly accepting anything that a creative person puts out, no matter how bad it is, is not being a good fan. It's just being a follower. And I would love nothing more than for Indiana Jones 5 to be an amazing entry into the series. I would love it if James Mangold proved me wrong and made a fantastic Indiana Jones 5 film. I would love that because right now I'm worried that it's not going to be a good movie. But if he comes out and delivers, I will sing his praises to the day I die because I want a good Indiana Jones movie. That being said, I can still be critical about it up to the point where it comes out and then I can be super critical about it. But if it's good, I will give it its props. If it's bad, I will you know, dissect it in much the way I do other bad movies. Um, but th- this idea that true fandom just accepts whatever the people give you. That's not my definition of fandom. My definition of fandom is is that you protect the stuff that you love. And right now, Lucasfilm has a bad track record of, of handling stuff that the fans love. And they've shown time and time again a, a consistent uh, pattern of behavior in which they don't care about the fans and they run these franchises into the ground through their own ignorance and you know political agendas and stuff like that to the detriment of fans. And so going into Indiana Jones 5 after this long series of missteps with Star Wars, you can understand why I would be skeptical as to whether or not Indiana Jones 5 would be a good entry into the series. So hopefully if James Mangold still cares about my opinion, if he's still watching this stuff um, and what I have to say, sir, I hope that uh, you prove me wrong and that you make a fantastic Indiana Jones movie. I would love for that to happen. Yeah, I think that everyone agrees with that. I mean, 
Uh, yeah, I think that he went and he lost a lot of fans. I don't think that, like this thing is never going to wear it down, uh, especially like in our community, like the, the online fan community. This thing right here, this is Tim Miller 2.0, where he oh, made yeah. like that, that one thing and it's going to follow the movie all the way up until release. And then the movie had better be delivered deliver, because if it doesn't, this is what's going to come back to haunt it. Yep. No, I can see it already. It's going to pop up in several videos in the future as the the second chapter in the moment when we knew this movie was going to go to shit. And I brought up, like I said, how you have to go out of your way to make this movie shitty at this point because the fourth film was so bad. <laughs> like, really, I, I just Mangold has everything in his favor to just have kept his mouth shut and, and moved forward and got this movie done and let it speak for itself. All he had to do. All he had to do. Yeah. But, so, is there uh, any other uh, super chats directed at Matt? Or uh, I'm sure. Uh, uh, let us uh, let us uh, see real quick. I'm just going to do a quick refresh and see if there because there are many that are directed at this situation. I'm just going to see if there are some directed straight at Matt. Um, let's see. Um. No, I don't think there's any more that's directed specifically uh, at at Matt. I will share this one though. Mags says for five dollars. Oh, thanks, Mags. I was kind of hopeful for Indy Five. Now it's a big fat nope. Sorry, insulting the audience slash fans before it comes to theaters won't get me to watch it. And yeah, that's harkens back to to what we just said. Uh, I don't uh, don't think that um, this is going to be forgotten in the slightest. Also, on that note, the last millennial says for nine dollars ninety nine. For that, he says, "Hi, gang, it's Jacob here." I mentioned to you guys a few weeks ago that Mangold is my favorite director. Yeah, I remember that. But he continues. But after all this drama, I don't think he's my favorite anymore has lost lots of respect. Gary Fukunaga is now uh, The Last Millennial's new favorite director. So, yeah, I don't think that Mangold did himself any favors whatsoever there. Don't think so. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, Matt, I know that you have to be leaving. Uh, so, but tell us uh, again, where can people find you? Uh, well, uh, I've been putting a lot of my energy and time and effort into our weekly podcast. We basically do three shows a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we actually put out content on a daily basis. So Tuesdays, Thursdays, weekends, we actually put out stuff as well. But our main shows are Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and uh, they're long form content. So like, you know, they're hour plus long stuff. Uh, right now we're doing a week-to-week -week review of Loki. We got our main show on Friday where we do our theme shows where we talk about a certain type of theme and three movies that go along with that theme. And then on Mondays we do our focused reviews where we try to do stuff that's like new releases and things of that nature. And like I said before, it's more of a comedy show. Like we sit there, it's a couple friends just BSing about movies and TV shows and stuff like that. It's got the kind of vibe where if you're in a bar with friends, talking about this stuff. That's what we're going for. And uh, it's just meant to be kind of a fun escape from all like the heavy drama and, and stuff going on in the world. Like we want to entertain people and we have a lot of fun doing it and it's meant to be funny. So you can get us uh, as the audio only podcast on Apple uh, podcasts and Spotify, and Google podcasts, pretty much any place that you can listen to podcasts. We're on there. And uh, our YouTube channel, we've been doing YouTube's um, hardcore since January. We've got over uh, 140 videos up there for you guys to watch if you want to check those out. And we've got a setup. We we're trying to be the Tim Pool of movie review things where, like, we film all four of us uh, having our conversation. We kind of cut in clips from the movies that we're talking about, and, and we, we try to make it like a talk show format almost. And so, like, it's, it's visually entertaining. It's something that you're going to want to watch on YouTube. And uh, we're just having a good time doing it. And we just hit yesterday our 1,000 subscriber goal so we can finally be monetized. 
And you guys have been so great in helping promote our channel and in, in the past and stuff like that. So we really appreciate you having us on today to talk about this stuff. And we appreciate everyone who uh, is, is your subscribers and your followers who also want to support us coming over, subscribing to our channel, checking out our content because we work really hard at it. Like there's some YouTubers who, you know, not to, not to discredit what they do, but they just sit in front of a webcam and kind of throw it up after they do a stream of consciousness. We sit down, we, we do a, a hardcore recording, we do editing, uh, we, we try to master it so that it looks as good as possible. It, it's been a learning curve, so not all of our videos look as professional as they should, but the important thing is that it's fun, it's funny, it's interesting. And if you guys wanna support us, just go to saltynerdvideo.com. That takes you right to our YouTube channel. You can subscribe, follow us there, watch our, our videos, and just let us know uh, uh, what you think of them and, and be part of our community because we're really trying to grow it up this year. We're, we're six months in and we think that we've come a long way and uh, we can't wait for what the future holds. In other words, I won't be back there anytime soon. Oh yeah, you will. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, a little links for all of that is of course in the description and accidental tourist states he just subscribed. So thank, now he's the one. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, that's it. awesome. And also something we also appreciate is uh, Matt, you taking the time to come here and uh, and uh, join us. Um, well, well, as always, yeah, thank you, you so much for more subscribers. So also, yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, I'm always amazed that you guys actually care about what I have to say enough to feature me on your little live streams. But, well, but now that Hollywood knows where the opinions at. You know, you guys are ahead of the curve. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've always been a good friend and uh, of us and the channel. And, and you know, as far as uh, your your uh, channel goes, c congratulations on hitting a thousand. Thank you. But remember, folks, it, that doesn't do as much as the watch hours. You need to get the watch hours too. So, get over there, check out these guys' content. They're a really good group. They do some good stuff. And like I said, I've popped up a few times before, so you never know when I'll pop up again. And yeah, yeah so check it out. We're we're good if you want something playing in the background because a lot of our shows are hour and a half to two hours long or if you have a long drive or commute to work you know you can listen to our podcast on youtube or uh, spotify or whatever um, your preferred podcast platform is and we fill the, the those long travel gaps uh, very well especially because we have we have close to 100 episodes of our main show out and close to like 300 episodes in total so a lot of content to be consumed and even if you don't like the movie we're talking about or haven't seen the movie we're talking about it's more about our reaction to it because matt vader is very salty alex is very salty <laughs> my, my my girlfriend is crazy so uh, we have a lot of very entertaining uh, conversations. Uh, Speaking of, tell her hello. And uh, yeah, the cool. rest of the crew, of course. Um, but real quick, what did you think of Loki episode one? I actually really liked it. Uh, I have Get to, out. I have to <laughs> go, I have to go back and rewatch it and kind of break it down a little bit. But after Win winter soldier, um, this was like a breath of fresh air for me. So, Oh, but it. No, so basically, no. what you're saying is that uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier was, was so, so bad. incredibly bad yes. that that your uh, expectations have been lowered yes. to the point that that is exactly good. what I am saying. Yes. yes. Whereas in my <laughs> case, I just thought it was horrendous because I missed out on Falcon and Winter Soldier in its entirety. But deliberately, I might add, because I could see right away how horrid, horrendous that yeah, was. We're, so we're going to yeah. drop our first Loki review on Wednesday, and so we'll probably have a lot of different opinions on the podcast about it. Yeah, well, that's the beauty. That's uh, you you have a conversation with different opinions. So that's the uh, that's the awesome thing about that. Yeah, we, we get a lot of different views on the Salty Nerd podcast, and uh, it's, it's kind of funny because there's something for everyone to agree with. Like if if you agree with me, you might disagree with Alex and Vader, or if you agree with Jude, you might disagree with me. So like like uh, there's something for everyone on the show, which is what makes it fun because we're not all in lockstep with one another. We argue and we make fun of each other and we we give each other a hard time over our choices. Exactly. Well, that's how it is supposed to be. Uh, so that's brilliant. With that, Matt, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Really, thank you for really me. appreciate that. Yeah, it's always fun to get to hang with you. Yeah, yeah. always. Oh, a pleasure. I, I wish I could be on longer, but I've got other no stuff. No problem. And you always a uh, possibility you may pop up on Midnight's Edge After Dark uh, sometime too. So check this out over there as well. And check out the Salty Nerd podcast. Um, they do good stuff. So thank you, you guys go. so much. Yes. Also, buy his books. He made Earthman Jack. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, if you want to see how good of a writer I am or how bad of a writer I am, you can check out my books at kadishbooks.com. Yeah, well, there there's so, so many of them uh, suggest that you're a pretty decent writer. So there you go. All right, guys. I'll catch you later. See you soon. Take care, buddy. Excellent. Bye. Take care. Um, before we get back into Super Chats, uh, I got a tweet here that might scare us. Okay. I, It's not fucking... You've got me worried now. It's not like, well, not like that bad, but like it's Kevin Smith. So, oh, yeah, I was afraid of that. I was like thinking, uh, it's T Man. Oh, crap. It's T Man. Yeah, T Man. -Man. Sorry. I was trying to make, okay. Yeah, it's worse than you thought, I guess. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> exactly. hope he's, That's like I hope he's thing. fucking kidding with this. Uh, this oh, guy asked, he's... can't wait for Masters of the Universe. I can feel how inspired the project is from that pitch perfect trailer. Thanks, Kevin Smith. Kevin came back with an honor of the era in which Masters Official began each of the five episodes in part one of our series, homages, different 80s flicks. I don't think he's kidding. Episode one is Superman 2. Episode two is Indiana Jones and Temple Doom. Episode three is Batman. Episode four is Hellraiser. Fine so far. Episode five, Masters of fucking Universe. <laughs> that would be like a carbon copy of a carbon copy of a carbon copy. Oh, I'm not too worried. Oh, I, you had me scared there. Like, this doesn't worry me. Oh, uh, that mean, episode I, five does. Man? Really? Okay. Well, yeah, well, then I guess that maybe Skeletor is going to be parading parading around in the middle of the night with no one watching in dump water, Florida. Uh, if like like anything, it says, guess so, yeah. Makes, yeah, like Master of the Universe, He Man wins at the end. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm really excited about episode four. That's going to reference Hellraiser. That's yeah, that's going to be my heavy. curiosity. That, that, that piqued my that. curiosity right there. I bet that's going to be a heavy Evil Lynn episode. Um, oh but no! Okay, well, you, you just my, oh my god, that blew my mind. Heavy Evil Lynn episode. Yeah, I bet you. Well, Superman two, <sighs> I can understand. It's going to be the two bad, you know, two big bad guys against you know, the big bad guys Lost against the big power. power. He's a good guy. Lost yeah, Superman Lost power. And then Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom, and this is why I, I love like Temple of Doom. Yeah, it's going to be something more dark and whatever. But like he he did the same kind of shit with Clerks the animated series. That's why I buy it. Well, I'm I'm perfectly content with that. So uh, there's many many things I'm worried about with that series, but this ain't among them. So yeah. Well, I. <laughs> There was another report come out that said that yeah no it's pretty okay cool. I felt I just felt good now you had to go and tear okay, that down okay you feel good I'm not so sure about this 1987 fucking well neither am I when I think about it could be like, <laughs> like they could bring in Gwildor or maybe they bring in the Cosmic Key or some bull crap like that I don't know Robert Let's Duncan McNeil and Courtney Cox lend their voices to their characters I don't know like. <laughs> What's gonna happen there? They go to Earth. Uh... There's a, there actually there's a very very little that you can reference from that uh, from that movie and have it turn out good. Uh, I will grant you that. But uh, but yeah, yeah. Well, but maybe they maybe they have a Frank Langella come in or something. That would be pretty sweet. You give Kevin too much fucking faith, man. No, it's denial. Like it's all I have. <laughs> denial and morbid it's not curiosity. Denial, you admit it. <laughs> it's, it anyway, uh, again, yeah, I don't care about Star point. Wars. What happens with that? But this, but this thing freaking matters to me. You don't think it matters to me? I was gonna say, geez. I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure it does, but I have I hope enough it's good. worrying about myself. Thank you very much. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping it's good too, but I'm just like fuck. Like the last one of my, the last directors I want touching this shit is the showrunner. And yeah, anyway, yeah, Mr. Tickle Trunk. Look, a Dolph Lundgren character shows up. Ten out of ten. Okay, <laughs> if they have Dolph Lundgren come in and he and he gives the voice to King Grayskull. It Amazing. won't happen. You're, you're, no, you're thinking too much enough. like we yeah. would. Yeah, Kevin, don't get into this shit. Like the most we can hope for is he actually watched some shows and he actually dug into some good He-Man comics. That's you the know most what? I'd, we can I'd hope be for. fine if he just saw the entirety of the 2002 series. I'd be happy or with that. Or that actually better yeah. off, but I don't think yeah. he did. 
I don't think it's going to really reference that at all. But I could be. I hope I'm wrong. I'm just going to say. Well, that the beauty is, like, if it references the 2002 series, no one's going to know the difference because that exactly. was such a perfect distillation of filmation, anyway. Well, yeah, it's the way I like. I've said it's almost the way I would set up a trilogy of movies. Yeah, you know, and, and but the sad part is now is that there's that stupid separation with Shira, but whatever, you don't need her. Let them go fucking ruin that property for all. Well, they already did, so it's too late for that. Yeah, it's too late yeah. for that. That actually disappointed me because I I dug Shira a lot. She was a cool character. Me too. Yeah, it's me too. I also much, like Shira. much more interesting pair. I've said this many times before. She's a much more interesting character than Prince Adam ever was. Yeah, like she's she was evil, went to the good side, be, started. It's like she's in a she's in a battle where she she's is a spy. You know, she's a spy, but again, she's part of a very small rebellion against a giant empire of Hordak. Like it's it's a very hopeless like situation. Yet she manages to pull it out every time. Well, that's what's so it's cool fun. about it. Yeah. Like the it's not like two superpowers fighting each other. It's one superpower and one struggling uh, rebellion to, to. It would be like if He Man was doubling as Beast Man. <laughs> yeah, there'd be that too. That's what that I'm saying. Would, like, you, that would you, actually be hilarious. That's what I'm saying. You have this whole, and that's what pissed me off about that series when I went off of my original rant is like, Shira has so much more shit you can get into than He Man ever did. But you need He Man for Shira to work, and that's the yeah. beauty of it is she's raised as a bad guy, but yet she has her whole world flipped upside down on her, and in the process of it, she's instead of you know changing things, she like works as a spy basically, and she also has. The, the you know the whole Shira thing going on at the same time. It's this really cool dynamic, and and there's a lot more characters involved. And sure, the world's a bit more cutesy, but instead of doing a more adult, cooler version of that, they went the opposite direction. Which fuck, and then and they wonder why it failed. But anyway, Dash D says now that Orko is a strong, independent female um thing. <laughs> her magic. I, I, I think that Orko probably uh, probably goes by the by the. Um, they, uh, pronouns they them so they co uh uses their magic to get out of jail free card they win all the time yeah pretty much yeah I, if orko has figured out the magic by then because that was part of his gimmick is how do you fuck up orko well it may, don't ask such questions because you may get them answered <laughs> But yeah, anyway, uh, we're about to go through Orko some is one of the chats few before of the we uh, sidekicks before... that I didn't find uber annoying back in the day. No, no, Orko, he was the second best Orko of all the 80s comics. Like, I would like to say that, uh, like, in the 80s, you all, you had like these the stereotypical snarf, characters that went by, and I call them all the Orcos. Like, Snarf and all of those, to me, that's just an Orko. They're all Orcos. Right. All of those characters, right? There was one series which had the best Orko. And that was Jace and the Wheeled Warriors. I forget the name of that little robot thing, but that was the best yeah. Orko of all of them. Well, and I think this actually starts more from the Flintstones. What the hell is that thing called that keep, keep buzzing around? I can't think of it. Oh, hell if I know. The Great Kazoo or, or whatever. That was like the original one. Yeah, okay, fine. So he was Orko before there was an Yeah, Orko. he's Orko. Me, still all Orko. Patient Zero. But no, you're right, because Orko is where it's like it's at its peak. Slimer, I guess you can get away with just because Slimer can barely talk. Because Slimer was just kind of like Orko's lesser cousin, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Again, he, he was like the, the last Orko, I guess. Eh, I don't know about that, but he was the least annoying of the the, the continuation of yeah. them. Oh, Luffy is called. Oh, my fellow Norwegian remembers his name was Una. Yeah, oh, yeah. There we yeah, there we go. That might be right. That was a oh, that was a great series. Yeah, script. Scrappy. Why why has no one done anything more with Jason the Wheel Warriors? That's a good question. <laughs> you, oh, I do know exactly why. Because uh, because Greta Thunberg would be upset. Because uh, because uh, it's machines on the quest to destroy plants. Scrappy Doo is not an Orko so much as he is a cousin Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, they all fall in the same category. That's for sure. Uh, but anyway, uh, but yeah, we have some more new stories to to cover, yeah. and if we don't, then Tom better find some real quick. Uh, and before we got into the super chats, uh, we uh, I want to address uh, address some quick things in the um, in the community. Fear is the mind killer. Upgraded his membership, so oh, thanks awesome. for that. And Alexander Grum 
just became a member and went straight to Edgelord. So thank you so much for that. Really appreciate that. And while we also address community, uh, there is uh, there is someone else that I also would like to give a shout out to. I'm going to share uh, share my screen here. Just give me one second so we can find the right thing here. Uh, yes, the, here is a, a fundraiser for someone from someone who needs your help. Uh, it's Bird of Prey Five, who is uh, wheelchair bound. Uh, this last year has been rough on yeah. everyone, and it's of course been especially rough on anyone who is disabled because income might not be coming in as before, help might not be coming in as before. And uh, Bird of Prey, he needs some wheels. More specifically, he needs a wheelchair. And this is not going to come out of empty nothingness. Yeah. So he he needs your help. So for that reason, uh, I have put the link to his GoFundMe in the description of this video. So go and uh, read about uh, about it and uh, support. Uh, if you have a few few dollars that you can spare, then go help out uh, Bird of Prey to get a new wheelchair so that he can get around. Um, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, he's just he's been getting kicked more and more and more. No matter what he does lately, it seems like he's actually in a situation right now where. He health wise, he needs a lot of help. Um, Gary and stuff brought it up last week, and I think they may have been getting in contact with some people. But that's the thing is he can't leave his house. It's really difficult. And he's got a heart issue right now that's very serious. Um, so any little bit right now will do any will help a lot, I'm sure. So I know it's tough for everybody right now, but this guy is somebody who's a great friend of the community. He's always been around. I've been on his show a few times. He's been on Midnight's Edge After Dark. He's a very good friend of the community and anything that can help. Yeah, are they still looking for a cardiologist, Red Tigress? I, I know there was some progress, um, but I haven't been kept up to date on everything. So um, I know there's videos on his channel that explain everything he's dealing with. So I'm not going to get into all of the uh, details here, but yeah, I see there's a lot of love for bird of prey in the chat. Um, definitely do what you can to help, help him out. So uh, it'll, it's definitely a good cause. I think we lost Andre because we had a no. Well, I'm right here. Uh, okay. So yeah, we're gonna leave that on uh, on screen uh, while I go through a couple of more of the classic super chats. Now these are super chats that I can't get up on screen, so you're just going to have to uh, to listen and uh, see if you can uh, help out a little bit there. Uh, now, uh, classic Super Chats. Stephen Otten said for $10, Hail Andre, Tom, Matt, Wrenches, and Midnighters. If a major Hollywood studio does not want us to watch their movies, then I will oblige them. At least, now I know what spurging off means. Yes, indeed. But use the term meltdown instead. That's yeah, I shouldn't be using yeah. it, but my kid uses it himself, so whatever. Yeah, well, it's okay, but it's okay in his case. It's kind of like, you know. Yeah, what? I know, I shouldn't. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Pilgrim Media says, just, watched, just watch any Mangold interview, and it's obvious what an SJW he is. Oh, well, it's so, yeah, clear. I haven't, yeah, he's I haven't had the pleasure, but... Um, but uh, being but script, of that mindset, I was gonna say, script. You've commented on this before, and I'm sure you know, you know part of the reason you're incognito is because the way that Hollywood and the inside the industry treats people with different types of political beliefs, and you almost have to like jump on this train or even pretend at some points. It seems like in, in some cases it's that. The other part too is they just. And a lot of people just don't like any sort of counter argument or point of view. You could even be politically aligned with many of them and just be uh, of a slightly different opinion or a slightly different criticism. And that can do a lot of damage to, to your, to your standing um, in that community. So yeah, it, it's, it, it's a series of weird, some parts are just, you know, business relationships. Other parts are something that can do a cult. 
Um, I'm being a little hyperbolic there, but it's, some days you're just like, why are people all touting the exact same talking You're not wrong, though. We even, see it, we even see it somewhat in this community where it's like, you know, people get surprised if, you know, one of us gets into a disagreement or we don't all agree on. So it's like, it's not an echo chamber, folks. And that's the last thing we want. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, you're going to have people not agree on everything all the time. And the last thing I want is like, you know, you and I have disagreed on things before, but we don't sit there and go, well, fuck you. I'm never talking to you again. You know, <laughs> and that's why these people act is like, you're right. It's like, as soon as you say something that goes against their, that's, that's funny. Cause they're the first one to call you a bigot, but that's the, the definition of a bigot, you know? <laughs> but anyway, we're going to get down that road. But anyway, we have more super chats. Uh, continue Andre. Yeah, in uh, indeed. And uh, just to take a quick break from the classics to the ones we can bring up on screen, uh, Golgo13, a.k.a. Brandon the Infinite Wolf, says, This is why I choose to be part of this community. We help our friends. Cheers, y'all, and thanks for being such good friends. Cheers, y'all. No, no, cheers to all of you that uh, make this community what it is. Well, yeah, and, uh, and bird, of, bird of Prey, I mean, just the hand he was dealt is not fair at all. So like the, be the, the least you guys can do is more than helpful. So I know things are tough all over, like I said, but uh, anything will help right now because he's dealing with so much shit. It's not even fair. Yeah. And uh, the rookie critic also says, as someone that hasn't seen He-Man before, the trailer looked pretty good. If it turns out to go down the walk path, they did a decent job hyping it. Yes, the trailer is mind-blowing. I mean, I couldn't ask for a better trailer for a He-Man revival. It's everything I would have wanted from a trailer. I just hope that the series lives up to it. Beyond the first episode. But as far as trailers go, kudos to whoever cut it. Uh, and uh, then moving on with the classic Super Chats. Just have to go back to where we were because I lost that there. Fantastic. Um, ah, yeah, here we, uh, here we are. Um... Stephen Otten says, Tom, putting together a puzzle in the dark can be done. It just takes <laughs> a lot of concentration in reference to putting together the editorial that is now out. And uh, yeah, it could be done. It just took a lot of concentration and a bit of time, didn't it? But it was all well worth it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I uh, don't want to run into those issues, though. Those are what makes take the longest, especially when they're long to begin with. Exactly. And Hypergyver2 says, this is why Ghostbusters Afterlife is going to succeed. The Reitmans are making it clear that they are fans and love the fans. Well, yeah, in this case, good. I think we've got, you know, Ivan Reitman and Dan Aykroyd, I think have made it well known that they weren't too happy with the last movie. And the last thing they need right now is to piss off any more fans. Jason Reitman has proved himself in his own right. <laughs> Pun. <laughs> uh, you know, so there's there may be some nepotism involved, yes, but at the same time, it's like there's no better person to take over this job. Uh, and I don't know if Script would argue with me on that one, but I know I know you have probably a thing or two to say about it. Uh, I, I think he's a, an appropriate choice. He's been with Ghostbusters since the very beginning, even as a kid. Um, I'm disappointed I don't have any say in being able to write it because I, I, that's one of the things right. I would love to have done. But um, I really hope he comes at it with the same direction and approach that, uh, that uh, I mean, the original kind of team sort of has. And that he gives us something really great. And so far, he hasn't done anything to the contrary. And if you check out... Um, uh, the any of the ghost uh, core channels that are on YouTube and even some of the social media stuff, they show uh, Jason Reitman's own excitement of like going back and rediscovering lost footage and, and jokes and scripts and story ideas of the original Ghostbusters and some Ghostbuster 2 stuff that the, the excitement he has is quite genuine and very much uh, in line with a lot of the other you know Ghostbuster fans. So you've kind of got a really good kismet relationship uh, right now. And I'm hoping it ends up being a very successful thing. And, you know, for, for the Canadians up here, this Remembrance Day, November 11th, that's when the movie's going to debut. 
and I am definitely going to be there opening night. There you go. Right, very cool. Uh, and uh, then moving on, Silver Nova says uh, they need to take to to Twitter and in. Uh, no, the need to take to Twitter and insinuate people are basement dwellers shows a lack of professionalism that is all too common these days. Yeah, I agree so so much. Actually, I've made a video yeah, about yeah. that, uh, bemoaning the lack of professionalism among Marvel comic book writers in particular. But it seems to be pretty wide throughout uh, the creative industries and. Uh, Maybe some people should be having Twitter accounts if they can't control themselves. Because it's not just that they make themselves look bad. They're actually hurting the product of the bill payers. Now, in this case, mm -hmm. it's Disney and it's Lucasfilm. And it's a, it's a movie that no one really asked for. But still, the principle stands. He is gambling someone else's investment and someone else's money and Disney shareholder value and all of that just because he felt the need to go after Matt Kadish simply stay making a statement some statements of facts on Twitter. Well, it's repeating history. You would think that somebody would be like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're repeating the same thing that you did with fucking Star Wars. Stop. Time out. We don't need this one going down the tubes too because Lord knows you're only going to get one or two more things out of this. Exactly. I mean, Indiana Jones ain't going to last forever. Come on, kids. It's on overtime mode ready. If exactly. So I would think that, I, I think that you're right. I think somebody called him and said, what the fuck are you doing? No, that's, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I would be shocked. Like, yeah, it could be that whatever he was on past or maybe his, his manic stage pastor, I don't know, but I'm more inclined to believe that uh, Monday morning happened and someone in Disney's disaster relief team or crisis management or whatever were on the phone and came to his house and told him, stop what you're doing. Here we have a statement. All you have to do is just copy and paste this. And then, and then we'll talk on Monday. That's what I think happened. I could be wrong, but I'm inclined to believe it had to be something like that because there ain't no way Disney is going to stand by and watch a director of a hundred million feature of theirs make a complete ass out of himself on Twitter for very long without doing anything about it. I mean, the Disney, they have a social media clause in there, don't they? The only other thing I can see, yeah, exactly. And the only other thing I can see on this, and this is just a roundabout, like weird possibility. And that is, he doesn't feel in control of this production and he's acting out because people are shitting on it and it's things that he can't control. So it's, you know, I, I understand, I'm not saying I condone it, but I understand to a point where his frustrations are coming from possibly if that's the case. And you could have that. You've got, George Lucas still hovering around, even though he's not a major part of things. He's still a big part of Disney now that he's one of the major shareholders. This is his baby. Spielberg handed his baby over to you after he made a shit movie. So you think Spielberg would want to like at least kind of make up for that? Nope, he walked away. So you have that strike right there. Otherwise, why would you go after somebody like Matt? Even if he did, because I don't believe that he thought Matt was any kind of journalist up front. I really don't. I think that was a, him trying to cover himself a little bit down the road. Yeah, I think so, too. I think he just went after Matt and probably a bunch of other fans. But it just so happened that Matt was somebody who is in a, in a community. And just so happened that, you know, you know, he had people to back his ass up. And I'm sure there's a lot of other fans who may not have who got really fucking shit on. I can't prove this, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering. I'm going to go look maybe and see, but I think he deleted a lot of the evidence now. So again, he, he apologized, but to me, it's too little too late. You, you shit the bed already. This is, I think you're right, Andre. This is that signature moment. Just like when Tim Miller said what he said, just like everything that happened with Ghostbusters, everything that happened with the last Jedi, like Ryan Johnson going out there and saying, you know, everything from your Snoke theory sucks to, to all the accusations that were thrown by everybody, including the media. This is that moment that that will define this movie now. You're right. Unless this movie knocks it out the fucking park. So it has to now. It can't just be better than Crystal Skull. It has to be as good as the other Indiana Jones movies now. 
or it's done. He done fucked this whole thing up right here. This is the moment. Yeah, script. Your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, it could be that. Could be some stress getting to him with regards to the shoot. Uh, I'm just perusing some of his tweets now because I, I only really saw the initial two, so and then made my own little uh, thing well, on the side. He went on for like twelve hours, dude. But um, yeah, it seems to me like uh, he may have been um in an altered state and probably didn't, I mean, cause the accusation about a journalist or the um, implicate implying of him being a journalist, I think that was, that's more like a not being fully, not fully paying attention to what's going on in front of him. And uh, yeah, I mean, the other part too is only a few weeks into production and already he's getting uh, outsiders <laughs> criticizing his work. That's also gonna, gonna hurt um, the ego uh, quite a bit as well. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think he, he definitely dug his own grave on this one here. It's, uh, it's up to him to climb him, climb his way out and, uh, assuage any counter arguments to what he's doing. Cause again, we, we do know he's a competent and effective director. Um, I, I did like 310 to Yuma. I thought that was a pretty good remake. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, listen, this is, uh, Th this is not as common as we we like to think it is. Again, out of all the directors in the industry, we, we've got a handful now <laughs> that have made these types of claims and are following this very peculiar playbook for some odd reason. And I, I wish there was a very easy answer as to why they think this is a good idea. It, it just boggles my mind. It never seems like a good idea. Well, I honestly, I don't think that he thought it through. I do not think that he, that he did any kind of, shall we call it, 4D chess or even a regular 3D chess no. where you have to like think a couple of steps ahead. I don't think that he ever thought of, uh, thought of uh, okay, if I put this in a tweet and I start insulting this guy, What's going to happen after that? How is he going to respond? And then how am I going to respond to that? And how can this escalate? And how is uh, is Disney's crisis management team going to respond to that? I don't think that he ever thought that thought. I think that, again, maybe he was in, shall we say, altered state of mind or whatever. I think he was just there. I think that he was browsing the Indiana Jones 5 hashtag and then he came across Matt, and he's like, "Well, this little mother, I'm gonna yeah, show him." I think it's as simple as that. Could be, yeah. That's what I was saying yeah. before. Is I think he had a rough week. Uh, I'm not so sure that these quote unquote leaks of the paparazzi were actual leaks because there is a lot. There are so many of them out there. It's like this just seems too convenient, and I don't think the response is what they were expecting. I think, I, I think I think they're like you have paparazzi that do that. You have many like sites like just jatted and other stuff like that that have people that that go and look and take pictures and then they drop them and they get loads of money from selling those pictures elsewhere and putting on sites stuff like that. I don't necessarily buy that these are deliberate things that they have put out. It could be, but I don't think so. What there's I there's just too many of them. If they have a person in there who's at liberty to snap a ton of pictures, but again, you, you could be right. But I, I we didn't get anything think... like this coming out of Star Wars, is my point. Well, but but the Star Wars was filmed inside of a studio. We got even not more all of pictures. it. Hey, bullshit! Because J.J. Abrams took a green screen to the fucking desert. Well, that's, that's the other part too. There's <laughs> no, not a saying. whole lot of photographers really want to go to the desert. No, that. I know. But, but I would say still... that the, this entire relationship, this behavior reminds me of, of the movie Chef with John Favreau. And it just it just feels like, yeah, he's got to work his way out. And uh, I actually also recommend watching that movie. It's a good movie. But, um, yeah, the guy had a bad week. He made a mistake online, and it's uh, hurting his reputation. And uh, now he's got to kind of right the ship. If he's smart – um, which I mean, I, I still think that James Mangold is a very intelligent guy, and even though he may be um, a jerk, uh, if he's smart, he will figure out a way to right this ship and and get people on board. But it's it's not going to be easy. I mean, uh, we based on that 12-hour rant, uh, so to speak, and uh, the response we're seeing across social media platforms on this, it's going to be a very difficult mountain to climb. 
Yeah, indeed. With that, let's move on with a couple more super chats. Um, on the, on the topic of altered state of mind, Dash D's says cocaine is a wonderful thing, makes you an a hole and lets you stay up longer to prove it to everyone. Please <laughs> add relevance here. And Mr. Tickle Trunk says Mangold is a good director. This is a shame. Yeah. Uh, James P. says, he said there is more to Indiana Jones than getting beat up and dragged behind a truck. That is more proof they don't understand Indiana Jones. Uh, Isn't that Drew, the proof that they do understand Indiana Jones? Because if they're saying he's more than the action set pieces, which is true. Yeah. That, that's Again, a little I don't tricky think that, one to do, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we... Uh, the, the, there's absolutely more to it, but uh, have they gotten the right things from it with Kathy yeah. and Kennedy running the show? That, of course, yeah. does is Kathy a completely Ke different story. Exactly. Does Kathy believe that Indiana Jones is only the action set, the action yeah. set pieces, and not? And theater? you know what the problem is with James Mangold? Yeah, he has made some really, really good movies, but you know what he does when when he gets a character like uh, like uh, Wolverine. Because he did two Wolverine movies. Everyone praises Logan, and I agree that's really, really good. But he did the Wolverine before that, and few movies have dropped the ball as badly in the third act as that one. And what both of those movies did was deconstruct Wolverine. None of them were kind of like the Wolverine movies that fans have always wanted. They were good movies. But but if you haven't seen them, and you were the, and you were told to imagine what's the ultimate Wolverine movie, no one would have come up with those two, because he deconstructs and imagine. So here we then have a movie by uh, by uh, Kathleen Kennedy having ultimate creative oversight, headed by a director who deconstructs. Just judging from what he's done before, I think we're going to get deconstructed Indiana Jones, meaning that there has to be some kind of uh, understanding of the character involved. But will it be the right kind of understanding? And how will they change him in that deconstructing? Mm. Those, I think, are the key questions in, in terms of what they, they might be doing. No, those are good questions because that touches on the whole uh, no country for old men theme. Um, and that that could be something a factor in this, uh, given that that pattern. Yeah, and um, No Country for Old Men is a great freaking movie. And Lord knows how many times I have been told that I sound like Anton Chigurh and look like him too. <laughs> but um, uh, but that is not anything that in any way, shape, or form should serve as any kind of inspiration for Indiana Jones. Yeah, not unless there, there's some sort of revelation where, you know, his mentality is like, no, I, I was still right about what it is, and I am able to adjust with the times and, and so far because, uh, yeah, like it's, uh, yeah, it, it, that's a complicated thing to address for, for such a type of hero. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and uh, Meta Random just sent us uh, in a super sticker. So thank you so much for that. That's much appreciated. And with that, we are returning to the classic super chats. Um, Silver Nova says, uh, in order to appear in movies 30 years from now, Harrison Ford will have to be wheeled out in a tank like a third stage guild navigator. Uh, yeah, don't give them ideas. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen there, but yeah. Uh, and Willie Woodward says for $9.99, as I replied to Mangold, I'm surprised someone that experienced would be as insecure about making a production. I thought it was just me, and he showed how not to respond to criticism. Uh, yeah, he uh, he did indeed, uh, and I maybe it was altered states of minds. Maybe he was just really, really stressed because he's feeling the pressure. Maybe things didn't work out as they they hoped they would. Maybe they didn't get the shots they were supposed to get this week. Maybe the dailies are horrendous. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah. But I'm sure. But I think he, there must be some level of stress there. I, I do think yeah, I think you're right. 
It gosh. would be stressful. I mean, Indiana Jones is a legacy. It's uh, <laughs> uh, you got to top the one before it, and well, actually, you have to do worse. It's uh, harder. You got to beat the Raiders. You got to do better than Raiders because, again, the Crystal Scroll not well received. So yeah, the, the only thing you can do is try to rate yourself against the best of the franchise, and that's that's an undertaking I do not wish on anyone. It's it's tough. Yeah, uh, and uh, then. Uh, we have um, uh, Troy Paselli who says this is no different than Andre's most recent comment on Loki. These people keep making the same mistakes over and over. Maybe they can't learn. Uh, and Marilyn's id says, I think when these directors lash out on Twitter, it's to preempt any criticism they know they will receive. Woke is trash, and they know it. Well, in this case, I don't think he did very good with preempting anything at all. On the contrary, he just fed what's going to be the recurring attacks against the movie. So, yeah, good going there. I mean, he should have expected this. I mean, even any director who's stepping into the role of a, another director who had directed the four previous films, and not only that is the most well-known director of all time, of course you were going to expect something like this. You should have just shut it off, man. Just shut it off. Yeah, don't be on Twitter. Problem solved. Well, I mean, seriously. I mean, you said it best in your tweet response script. It's like, dude, everybody knows you're not Steven Spielberg. Okay, take it from that angle. Use that to your advantage. Be like, look, yeah, I'm a huge fan. I'm, I'm upset Steven's not directing, but guess what? There's nobody better than me because I'm a fan and I think I can do a good job. And I hope you think so on July fucking whatever the hell it is, 2023, this movie finally comes out. And uh, Erik Runge Madsen in the comments, he has, a, he has a great comment here. And he says, in my army days, when someone lost it, the sergeant would give them a 10 kilo anti-tank mine in their backpack. That's more than 20 pounds for, for anyone uh, not using metric. We called it the two the kicks, whining biscuits. Mangold might need one. <laughs> well, look, I mean... I'll look at it from this perspective. It's not like the guy's under a shit ton. And that's kind of what I was just saying. The guy's under a shit ton of pressure. I get that. You know, you took on the next biggest franchise in the Lucasfilm roster and arguably one of the top probably 10 franchises of all time, at least. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. And I mean, we already okay. know the opening shot's going to suck because it's not going to transition from the <laughs> Paramount Mountain to whatever. Well, that's a good point, too, and I brought that up before once, too. Yeah, and then the other part of it is, look, okay, let's say for the sake of argument, I'm definitely fucking dead-ass wrong, and there's a shit ton of paparazzi getting on the set and fucking snapping all these photos, and he didn't want him out there. Maybe that's part of what set him off here, is he's pissed that all this shit's getting out there right away, and he just started filming. I can understand that, too, but the last thing you should do is get on fucking Twitter and start whining to fans or shitting on fans and especially punching down at fans. That's the part that bothers me. And anybody who sticks up for that behavior, I'm sorry, but I wholeheartedly disagree. Sorry. That's all I'm going to say on that. I'm done. Yeah. Uh, and then Meta Random also points out that uh, KK doesn't promote a creative environment. I've uh, heard that. Yeah, we, this is a recurring, uh, something of a recurrent uh, comment. Uh, and uh, Film School Rookie says for $4.99, thank you so much. As a new director, this is a great lesson to be super careful about what I post online. Don't want to kill my film by default. Yes, indeed, like anyone who is like involved in creating anything. Not really anyone, because... Like you have an employer, like many people do at least. Uh, I know fewer people have that now after the, the events of the last year and a half, but but still, you're always very often you are representing more than just yourself. 
which is why one always has to be careful about what one posts in social media. I mean, that stuff is dangerous, and it can always come back to, to haunt you. I mean, just look at how you have like people now that are being held accountable and cancelled for something they posted when they were teenagers a decade ago. And it doesn't even have to be anything that bad. So just be careful with putting yourself out there. I mean, seriously, social media is bad. You'd be better off without it. But if you have to have it, be careful in using it. Think twice before uh, before posting. Well, and we got a, a super chat we can bring up on screen here. And I know Stay York is probably being facetious here, but mm -hmm. if after less than a month of listening to KK's BS, he feels the need to attack fans, maybe someone should check on his wife and kids soon. Well, I, like I said, I know you're being facetious, but actually he's been on this now for like, what, almost six, seven months or more than that, almost a year. Because uh, this was announced, he was part of this. Because Spielberg, let me see. I know it was last year, sometime, if not long. Yeah, it was sometime last year that we learned Spielberg was not directing. Oh, he's probably been there for. I'm sure he's been there for more than a year already. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it's a long, long pre-production period before cameras actually start rolling, and oh, now yeah. cameras are rolling. So he will have been there in the planning stage for a very yeah, long over a time. year ago. Yeah, almost exactly. a year ago. For, yeah, roughly. Yeah, exactly. Spielberg left in February, and I can't find when they announced Mangled because all the new shit's taken over the news feed. But yeah. I, I remember it was yeah, long after that. that. Yeah, but still, this is a professional uh, thing, so yeah. let's not mix any of his private uh, private things into it. Uh, right, right, right. That's yes, what I'm uh, saying. Yeah, good handle on that. Uh, with but uh, but professionally. It's it's professionally that he that he failed in tweeting this. So let's all like keep it professional and attack him for that, not anything else. Uh, and uh, then we have Orville Nation. Good fans of the channel, go check them out. Who says for ten dollars? Love my midnight edge. Many thanks, Andre and Tom, for helping get the word out with Bird of Prey Fives Go Fund Me. You guys are awesome. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, and it's the least we can do, of course. We'll, we'll, we'll help spread the word when, when someone uh, someone needs it. At least we can do. And Wasapalooza the Drunk sent us $20. Thank you so much. Uh, there was no message to that super chat, but we thank you for the support anyway. Unless Google uh, got rid of it. Unless Google re redacted it. Uh, that's always a possibility. But uh, but in either uh, event, we, we thank you. Uh, and uh, then Notto says for $10, imagine if he had responded something like, hey guys, we're working hard on this film and hope it will be something you love. Reserve judgment while we work. See you at the theater. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've seen it before. Something as that, that's the professional response. Don't even have to say the reserve your judgment part. Like, that even almost is kind of standoffish. You just kind of say, like, you know, just say something like, we hope we can live up to your expectations or we hope we exceed your expectations. Things like that are a little bit more inviting than, you know, even something like that because that's kind yeah, of... Yeah, Exactly, but, but I, I see, I see not those points though. The point he's making. Oh no, he's, he's right. He's right. Totally. Yeah. But like my point is, is even the least like standoffish thing you want to avoid, especially in the situation. And that was what I was getting to before is Mangold should know that he's in this position. I mean, he took on Logan and, and Wolverine, which were like, what the sixth and eighth fucking movies in the <laughs> X-Men well, franchise. The, Wol the Wolverine yeah. was made deliberately. So people would forget Wolverine. Or exactly. <laughs> Yeah. So he's kind of been in this position before. He should know. You just kind of keep your nose down. You do the job, and rewards will come. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and uh, then uh, we have Tsukiyomi99, who says, I do not care how good your movie is when you insult the fans. I'm not going to support your work. I think that many feel it that way. And 200 Watt Studio says, my problem with de-aging Indy is that I will know that they de-aged him for the film. I know this is a CGI 78-year-old man. Oh, you're definitely going to know it with Disney's proprietary uh, de-aging software, which kind of sucks compared to the completely free uh, deep-faking technology. But, um, yeah. Well, don't worry That's about a year that. after the movie hits, like um, digital or Blu-ray or what have you. Someone's going to deep fake a cut for it. That's going to look better. 
Yeah, well, I hope they're going to do it for the whole thing. So you can now instead of just like one scene. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Get uh, off um, my set. <laughs> and Swinging Cod sent us a, a triptomon of Super Chats. Three for $5 each. Thank you so much. And there he says, going through them all, de-aging will be during World War II when Indy screws up and allows the Glocke to be launched because he is being cocky over a woman's warnings. It will continue in 1965 after the time-traveling Nazis come back. Marianne will have left Indy and Phoebe's character will shame him back in. She will constantly be saving him until the end when he sacrifices himself to save Phoebe, but it will be shown she had it handled all along. Yeah, I don't uh, think you're too far off there. There's things I've too heard far that are kind of, yeah, along those lines. Uh, yeah, we've heard many, many different things. Uh, some of them potentially exciting. Most of it less so. Yeah, we already know Mickelson's supposed to be playing like a Von Braun type character. Yeah. And we've seen the leak. Probably, only probably evil, but yeah. Yeah, so there's a, there's which, a which, I, which I'm, I'm sure that plenty of people could say with good reason that he was. So there's a there's a case to be made for that, but uh, but yeah. But no, I don't think that synopsis is too far off from what I've heard anyway. Yeah. Uh, and the Mega Wing Zero says for five dollars, Agents of Shield and Netflix Marvel is official officially better than Disney Plus Marvel. At this point, I'd have to agree based on what yeah. I've seen of it. Yeah. I would say first season Daredevil's really, really good. Uh, Some of the best of TV ever made. Uh, I mean, production wise, yes. Uh, Story wise, a little iffy here and there, but it, great performances. I mean, Mar um, ugh, uh, forgetting his name, but who plays uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. Vincent D'Onofrio, thank you. Uh, just he steals every scene he's in. Um, so so good. way more interested in him than I was in uh, Charlie Cox's Daredevil. But that's uh, that's no no slight against Charlie Cox. He did well as uh, as well. But yeah, I would say the the writing team on those shows are far superior to what we're getting with with the current ones. It, heck, even the showrunner of Loki, he's um he's a very green writer. He's only been around for a little bit. I regret that I didn't study up on everything he had done before doing that editorial. Uh, I have to say because that was uh, uh, did, did have you had, had a time to see my editorial on that on Loki yet? Yes, I did. Um, yeah, uh, I will. I, I only have one, not really a critique, but um, I do know what they're trying to do with the TVA, and it's not to say that the everything up into the end of, uh, end of the Infinity Saga is nothing or to be tossed away. It's they're trying to set up that the TVA is a far greater power and threat than the, the Infinity Stones. The effectiveness to which they conveyed that, it was actually poor, and that have, probably has to do with the fact that Michael Waldron is is not that experienced of a screenwriter in, within the industry. Or a um, public speaker. Well, he talks like he talks like a bunch of producers, and that's that's much different than a writer who then gets a producing credit. So he, he speaks the way producers speak to each other. And especially in some of the interviews I've seen of him, he's, he talks like how a producer talks to a bunch of writers and, mm -hmm. and other people with crude language, not very articulate, um, just getting to the point and get out type of stuff. Uh, that's not going to be in his favor. Um, and, but hopefully he has a better writing staff with him because uh, this is a sh this premise of a show really needs to stick the landing if it's going to work, and that's that's a very hard thing to do. Exactly, and I would agree with that completely. That I kind of like see what they're going for, but I disagree immensely with their execution of it. And if someone behind the scenes make like a rushed statement, like, "Well, that's all bullshit," and, like this is the real deal, and they use that as a shorthand. I have no issues with that if it's done behind the scenes. But when you say that same statement in a live interview, where you then basically, which is what he did, like we started. Well, the he said he wanted to make it. it look. He said he wanted to make it look like bullshit in comparison to the TVA. That's a very different context than just saying it's bullshit. Um, yeah. 
but he did not. I mean, again, that's what talking like talking. That's, about that's what I mean. If he, if, yeah. if he said, if they have that as a shorthand in conversations behind the scenes, I yeah. have absolutely no issue with it. But every single time he talks in front of a live mic, he makes a public statement, and exactly. uh, and if he can't make those distinctions there, then maybe he shouldn't be put in front of a live mic. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no shame in shame in him not going, uh, not going in front of a live mic. He doesn't have to. As a lead writer, if they don't think that he has what it takes to to answer questions in a diplomatic way, where he's not going to put stuff like that out there, then maybe he doesn't have to be put in front of live mics. Exactly. If he if he really wanted to sell the, the what was going on in this thing, he'd be like, listen, the Infinity War is a big thing. But the next step, the next step, we have to escalate it. And there's and everything that you think you thought was like, um, uh, like end of like high stakes for uh, End Game and Infinity War. That is that is not even scraping the surface of what we're gonna do with the the TVA and this Loki series. That's kind of how you present it. But instead, he uses exactly. the most shorthanded producer talk, producer language there is, and I think that comes from the fact of his inexperience because. Yeah. Uh, like he he was just an assistant for Dan Harmon, I think, with Rick and Morty, and did some little writing there. And then he wrote a script that got uh, a little popular on on an industry um, uh, like network group called The Blacklist. And from that, he was hired. So for some reason, he was hired uh, based on that script to to work on on Loki. And I think it had to do with the fact that his script was a time traveling comedy, and now he's going to Loki, which you know is a little bit of time traveling um premise so i think that's I mean, basically it was a big bait and switch uh on his part he, he oversold himself i i think in my opinion and feige was just uh did not have uh the right tools to vet him uh as he should have or maybe saw something in there that he could mold but is probably not getting the results he want which is would be the third strike with regards to the these last two showrunners that we've seen for wanda vision and falcon and the winter soldier yeah, because none of them have knocked and uh, knocked it out of the park by any objective measure that would be appreciated in the industry, have they? Exactly. Yeah. No. I mean, if this was if these were aired on network, they would not be working again for a while. They'd be knocked back down to like staff writer or assistant, and told you, you know, you had your shot, you screwed up. Um, now you got to start from the bottom again, so to speak. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking too. Uh, and then I want to welcome Erik Runge Madsen as a new member to the channel. Welcome. I hope you will enjoy the bonus content. Uh, and let's see if we have some more super chats to go through until Tom returns to us. We can get into the next item of the day. Uh, then we have, let's see. Uh, Straight White Mage says H.G. Wells had a prediction about basement dwellers. Mmm, tasty. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he did indeed. Uh, so we'll see how how that's going to work out. Confl uh, uh, conflating those with uh, with other kind of dwellers, and uh, so, and then let's see. Then we have uh, Steve York who says. Uh, if after, oh yeah, we got this one already. And Pilgrim Media says, uh, does Masters of the Universe 87 deserve an IMDb 5.4? Script Doctor, is 5.4 on the IMDb a good rating? Uh, well, really a good rating is anything above uh, 6.5 or 7. I would say 5.4 is kind of fair for masters of the universe given uh, what we got out of all the difficulties that the filmmakers uh had to undergo to, to, to make that movie um yeah i think i think that's appropriate I, I wish there was something like like this if there's any movie that needed a director's cut and like going back to redo some effects and some things that would be one of them that i would prefer over a over a, a snyder cut of justice league because that movie got a lot more, it had a lot more issues with it for financing and and the uh, powers that be than than it ever deserved to, because that could have been something fantastic. I, I did like the premise quite a bit, um, but yeah, that was 
it was a disservice to the to the to the franchise in itself but they they tried a lot of people in that tried really hard to make that a great movie and i enjoyed it as a kid as an adult it's a it's a fun little thing to throw on and see yeah. at that time as a as a sword and sorcery goof around fun movie it's great b movie but as a representation of masters of the universe it sucks oh hard, hardcore as uh, like one of the most disappointing movies I ever saw. There were a few movies I were as hyped for as that one when I first learned of it ex its existence. And I still remember the bitter disappointment. But yeah, that's me. I will say this. The the actual sword fight that the director spent his own money on to, to shoot, it was far more entertaining than it ever deserved to be. Yeah. Um, Don't worry. I'm planning on a retrospective for E-Man at some point. And uh, and also it should be noted that the, the that the guy doing uh, uh, doing Skeletor in the sword fight is the same guy that's it's like the swords guy I forget his name uh, but like that swords guy he's uh, doubling for uh, for Langella in that sword fight thing when they well, the guy who played Blade yeah yeah exactly him that guy uh, and uh, then we have the rookie critic who says soon. Unfortunately, everything will most likely be either rebooted or get the woke treatment. But I see it as a phase that will fade out. Hopefully. Fade in. Hopefully is the key word there. Uh, so let's hope that the people that fund all this get tired of it. Uh, and Vasapalusa the Drunk says, uh, I messed up the chat, but this movie is like hearing about a new theme park co-created by the designers of Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> Ooh. That's hey, I a like joke Chuck that's e. completely lost on me, but I take it that it must have been funny and you all got it, so I'll just uh, uh, blame me not being Chuck in e. the Chuck E. Cheese States. is like a, it's a arcade that has a pizza place built in with... Uh, and a ball pit. And, a, and all that stuff, and then like they have like a stage area where you eat. And it's got a bunch of animatronic singing puppets. Robots. <laughs> that that movie uh, that Nick Cage just came out with that he's locked in that place overnight. All right, that that's that's basically what a Chuck E. Cheese is. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Do are those places still around? Oh yeah, but they're just uh, um, they're actually coming in and far between. <laughs> yeah, did a pretty good video on it, and I think there's some other ones out there that it's it's one of those. It's one of those uh, companies that was separated at one point, and they were called there was Showbiz Pizza and Chuck E. Cheese, but they were ostensibly the same thing aside from the characters on stage. That was the only difference. Oh, okay. Oh well, well. And even Chuck E. Cheese showed up at Showbiz Pizza, so it was weird. It was it, yeah, it's got a real convoluted like background to it. But I mean, they're real fun places. They had shit pizza, but you couldn't help but eat it all. <laughs> I have to do a tour of those places next time I find myself in the states. But yeah, I mean, it was that was the place where I spent, you know, quarter upon quarter, you know, conquering TMNT arcade game and the Simpsons arcade game. And I think it was either the Marvel or the X-Men. I think it was X-Men at that time was first. But yeah, anyway. Anyway, uh, and then we have uh, Daniel who says from for, for $10, we are worlds apart from the days where Clark Gable and Charles Bronson were gunners in World War II. The current people in Hollywood, like Mangold, have no relation to the normal man, nor do they want to try. No, of course not. Why would they want to be near the pleb? I mean, you saw like the elitist attitude. So well, The elitist yeah. is its own, it's a legend in your own mind. It's not even an, an objective aspect yeah. of it no um uh, str red wolf comes in real quick with a five dollar super chat thank you for that says wait they're making a five night at freddy's movie jeesh that's going to suck even though nicholas cage being in it's already out str red wolf it's called uh willie's wonderland yep. and it was <laughs> some people thought it was shite some people love the shit out of it um it's definitely interesting because nicholas cage doesn't have a single line in the entire movie but he's so, in all of it. <laughs> that's going to oh, be a weird deal. It's like, I'll be in your movie for a few minutes with five lines, or I'll be in the whole movie with no lines. <laughs> well, I, I, or it's a something like he had the deal where he says, okay, I commit to being the movie, but you commit to paying me $10,000 per word. 
or something. I think like it had that. more to do with the fact Probably that we was. want to sell this to every country on the planet. So you're not going to say a word, Nick. <laughs> yeah, so let's uh, save money on subtitles and on yep. dubbing. Yeah, that's uh, not a bad idea. And uh, Dave the Impaler says, oh, yeah, Nazis are always used as a race propaganda against white people in modern films. Coupled with an aging lead and deconstructionism, not a good sign. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, see how that works out in the end. But Tom, uh, with that, we're actually caught up. So, uh, do we have any other topics to talk about today? Well, there's some tangentially uh, attached stuff here we can get into. Um, we've poked a little fun at this, but we, we might as well get into it. Clarice silenced. <gasps> Negotiations oh, no. stalemate Doom at CBS Doom series. <laughs> stalemate Doom CBS series to move to Paramount Plus, and nobody's surprised. <laughs> Uh, a month ago, Clarice was poised to move from CBS to Paramount Plus with the promise of a long-running for premium version of the Silence of the Lambs sequel. Now prospects for the series appear black as negotiations between the Viacom CBS streamer and co-producer MGM have reached a stalemate, I've learned. Additionally, I hear there's no viable path for Clarice to continue on CBS as the broadcast network already committed to a full slate of series for the next season. It would, be, it would mean the end of the road for the high-profile trauma, barring a major breakthrough in Paramount Plus negotiations, which it currently appears unlikely. Reps for Paramount Plus and MGM declined to comment. Um, let's see here. Industry veterans describe this as one of the craziest situations they've seen where the show with a season two pickup is facing demise and the prospect of putting 300 people out of work. It involves a marquee IP, Silence of the Lambs, a top producer, Alec. Kirk. I can't say that in the same top line. Producer, what? <laughs> <laughs> this this seems like some uh, someone put this out there trying to uh, trying to get some sympathy or something. Something. Uh, recently merged company, BS, uh, about to be merged studio MGM, which is in the process of being acquired by Amazon. Depending who you talk to at MGM, either abruptly stopped good faith negotiations that were closing in on an agreement, or the studio opted to walk away after being offered a mediocre deal it could not accept. The saga started with Clarice spending the spring on the bubbles at CBS, where The Freshman was the lowest rated and least watched scripted series in linear ratings. However, the serialized drama considered more suitable for streaming has been a strong performer on Paramount+. Plus. On May 14th, days before CBS's upfront, upfront present, presentation deadline reported that the network's drama SEAL team and Clarice were headed to sibling Paramount+, Plus, soon to be joined by Evil. According to sources, MGM-TV, which co-produces Clarice with CBS Studios, was notified that, that day of the plan to relocate the show. Um, I hear there was a lot of for back and forth between MGM TV and Paramount Plus about a deal May 14th through the 21st, an eventful week that included word about Amazon pending acquisition of MGM. May 17th, Paramount Plus announced the pickup of SEAL Team, blah, 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 blah. And however, no agreement for Claire Reese was reached. According to sources a close to Viacom, most, if not all, of concessions MGM asked for in the business terms, but MGM still would not agree to a deal. I hear the license fee for the show went from 1.2 million to 1.3 an episode at CBS, where the business model is based on deficit financing to three. Okay, script, you're gonna have to help us out with this one here. <laughs> uh, what all is deficit financing? Basically, yeah, they go into debt so that when uh, and then they file for they bankruptcy. spent 3.8 million dollars an episode on this shit. Well, it is a period piece that takes place, I guess, in 93, so that could get expensive. Yeah, you're fucking kidding me. But it doesn't need to be. That's the problem. Yeah, <laughs> why did they do that? That makes no sense other than to try to tangentially attach it to the film as much as possible, which is still... Well, well I, I do have a theory about that, and I'm not 100% sure how accurate this is, but part of me suspects that whatever formula Alex Kurtzman has with regards to budgets and productions... It seems like he's doing things to get as much money up front possible, regardless of 
so that um, he doesn't have to worry about residuals that will most likely never come to fruition for repeat viewings. He, it seems like he's fully aware of the quality and the uh, uh, the level of writing he's able to um, produce with the with the people he hires, and is just trying to grab as much money uh, through other production means uh, that, on the front end. Because, I mean, there's I, I cannot believe that in five years we're going to still see um, Star Trek Discovery, uh, Picard, and Clarice being on uh, a streaming service with a high residual return. Uh, I just don't think that's going to be the case. I don't believe that those titles, those shows will will bring in the audiences that those services will require. And as a result, Kersman is saying, well, since we know we can't uh, make this a lasting show, let's just take all of our money uh, as much money as we can at the front of the uh, production and allocate these costs in this way so that uh, we don't have to worry about those those decreasing residuals. Um, that That's my, my theory, because there's no other explanation as to why you would have a show so expensive and also be so god awful, unless you're ma- finding a way to make money off of doing it. Yeah, and how, where's the money in this? I mean, to me, this looks like a drain because it's been a complete flop, hasn't it? Which is why we have this story in the first place. I mean, if it did reasonably well, they would have kept it where it was. But it's obviously, it didn't. It's not popular, but if you go onto their IMDb stuff, whoever has watched the episodes have been rating it relatively high. There's some sevens in there. I think there's one that's five, but they're all above. Uh, they're all like seven and six point seven, six point five. Like that's a pretty remarkable rating system for a show that's not really all that popular on the zeit in the zeitgeist, so to speak. So whoever is watching it is enjoying it, whether they're paid for or some sort of aggregate through through amazon i don't know but the fact of the matter is that if this if those ratings are accurate then there should be no issue with regards to moving this over to paramount plus but clearly there's some there's some missing variables uh and yeah this it doesn't make sense and i think they only have two episodes left before their their first season is done and we haven't even had a proper confirmation that a second season is going to be um, in the works. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, to see how it plays out, uh, and also what the future holds creatively for a Hannibal Lecter spinoff that can't have Hannibal or any other related yeah. characters. Well, am I the only one here getting the vibe that they're trying to blame Amazon for this, even though Amazon would have nothing to do with this yet? Amazon. Because they brought up the deal with Amazon like 12 times in this article. Yeah. They're trying to get a move to Amazon. I I don't know. I didn't get that from it. But uh, yeah, it certainly could be script. What do do you make of that? Uh, That's a new one for for me. I don't know how Amazon plays into this exactly. Uh, Well, because they said that like the deal that CBS offered them was similar to the last one. And it was, you know, the even better or whatever, but MGM is still resistant. And then they bring up the sale a few times. I mean, they don't really attach the two, but because then they bring up one of the other series that's still going to be airing is already filmed. That's why it's, it, they make it sound like that's the only reason it's seal team or whatever, or whatever one it was, it's already filmed. So that one's coming definitely, but that's like the negotiations broke down for some reason. And it doesn't make sense, it sounds like to me. And that's that's what I'm getting from it. Okay, and I guess... As, 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 as Jay Allman points out there, Amazon is buying MGM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that, they bring that up like several times, but that isn't a done deal yet. And even if it does go through, they still have to honor a bunch of contracts and shit through, you know, I mean, it's... Well, Amazon buys all the contracts that MGM has and the distribution deals. I mean, their back catalog for MGM is not all that big in comparison to other studios, because, again, they were more into distribution stuff in recent years but there is a good titles from the past that very lucrative for them there is another part of this because remember paramount plus just plopped down some money to get mgm's catalog for paramount plus yep and they were even going to get no time to die but now that sounds like it's up in the air so i'm curious if amazon is causing a a bunch more problems than we can kind of see on the surface is kind of what i'm getting at here 
I could be could be right, of course. Could be and their purchase could affect a lot of deals that have some like short term exclusivity contracts and things of that nature. Well, yeah, because it sounds like the second season wasn't a done deal as it was, even though they announced it. If they're still negotiating, and then they're like MGM's like, no, we're walking away. They're, MGM's not in a place right now where they can just turn down money. That's another thing. That is true. And the other part, too, you have to ask yourself, just, has anyone seen any advertisement for Clarice that's not like on a commercial? Or like, have you seen posters, billboards, radio? Here and <laughs> like, there, but it's been very minimal. It's mostly been internet. Um, or like you said, during streaming, like while I'm streaming something else, then it'll pop up an advertisement for Clarice. Um, but otherwise, I have seen a few internet ads here and there but that's about it yeah i've like i, I commute into um into toronto like pretty frequently and i have not seen a single ad for clarice at all <laughs> and it's um publicly no yeah like just haven't se seen seen anything like there's not much behind it and if the show is really popular you you would get the exposure and well, we know it's not because this was also one of the ones that uh, M entertainment weekly hit wrote basically that hit piece on Kurtzman that I still love and I should fr buy and frame somewhere. I wonder if they ever put it in their magazine. But anyway, no, <laughs> no, it's just it was a beauty of a fucking review because it's like finally, finally, someone took the gloves off, and not only did they punch you know him back for this Clarice idea, they went after him for his whole repertoire. They went after him for everything, and I love that paragraph because it just it's so fun when they do that. It is because it's like who, and I love that bit. We're like. We need to stop this man from fucking up any more franchises. It's like, yes, please, thank yeah. you, God. Finally, somebody says it besides us. And, and <laughs> this is a prime example. I mean, and puts it in a notable publication. <laughs> well, and go back. We did videos on how this show was basically going to fucking tank, folks. <laughs> we predicted this pretty simply a year before it premiered. Yeah, because you know we had our hands on the script. I'm not going to say how exactly, unless that person doesn't care. But uh, <laughs> not only that, we knew right up front they're they're not going to be able to use Hannibal unless they make a deal. And that was something you made a, a video about specifically, Andre. I remember. So yeah, they're not going to make a deal. Not now, because now the holders of Hannibal are angry and bitter because they didn't get Clarice when they asked. So why should they give up Hannibal Lecter? Yeah, because Hannibal's a lot more important than Clarice's, and this fucking series just proved that. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, if there ever was a project that you could tell was doomed from the first second, it was this one. I mean, I could tell that that series was doomed. In, what uh, script? What year was it that Hannibal the series came out? Remind me here. 2013, 14? I was going to say 14 or 15, but yeah, I might. Oh, it came out a little earlier. bit earlier than that. It could have been a little earlier. 11, 11, 14, 15. It wasn't too far on the heels of that Hannibal prequel. I know that. No, yeah. that, that was, those were years apart. And, and, I, and I've had some uh, like little little work on that show uh, when I was, because I, again, I was, during the time before it was uh, canceled, I was working for a prop company that uh, did rent rentals for Hannibal and then also worked on um suicide squad so there's some overlay here and yeah like uh it, it'd been i think it's what four four or five seasons if memory serves so yeah it's um it, it was out for a while by two that was the 2000 was the movie uh but yeah, you're talking about the tv series sorry yeah no, the, the, I think it was around 2012, 2013, but w whatever it was. Anyway, ever since that moment, that was when the when like the rights divide first uh, became apparent. Was when that series happened that they couldn't use Glary Starling. Anyone could tell right then that MGM holding on to it was completely freaking ridiculous, because any Glary Starling series made without Hannibal Lecter, was doomed to fail, because it would just be a random procedural. And then what's the point of uh, being Clary Starling when you can't go with the one thing that makes Clary Starling interesting, namely your connection to Hannibal Lecter? Well, not what only that. Without that, random profiler. I hate to say this. If you go back and look at the story, for the most part, she wouldn't have gotten anywhere if it wasn't for Hannibal, 
Like, exactly. he's the one That's what who I mean. gave her everything. So if anything, she's probably one of the worst fucking detectives I've ever seen on fucking screen. <laughs> like, it's clearly the only reason she solves the case is because Hannibal was allowed to get in her fucking head. Like, yes. Yeah. Well, like that was that's the irony of it, and the 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 lost potential of a series like this is a a you know a young FBI agent in way over her head because of celebrity, and the only way that you can make her, I mean, it, basically it's just the same relationship. Like a hero is only good as its villains, as their villains. And here's a show where you could literally have a very interesting villain that would not be equal to Hannibal, but just different uh, than Hannibal, a different mentality, a different way to get inside um, Clarice's head or and, and mess with her, what have you, and force her to grow as a character. That's how you would make the dynamic. And I, and part of me suspects that this is the, the concept that Kurtzman and Jenny Lemmett were thinking of in their head, but just had no idea how to translate. Cause again, they're, they're not very good writers. No. And as a result, you have a, a cast and a crew that are all very, not very even good by accident. having to do this terrible show. You ever notice that Kurtzman has never even done something good on accident. No. <laughs> like, like, like at least you get to one, you know, like that's where like, what's his name? Goldsman, keep it Goldsman. That's why he's here. He's got like one or two by accident. It seems like at this point. And I'm starting to think the same thing about Terrio almost. Kurtzman killed the Zorro franchise. <laughs> the one, it's true. He, the, the Mask of Zorro was a huge hit. Uh, they were trying to get a sequel made. They went through a lot of issues. When they finally did get one, it was, unfortunately was Alex Kurtzman was, was the writer. And I don't know was, why Andre left that out of that on, video. but That killed it basically uh, in its opening weekend. Um, it did not do well at all. He's fucking poison. Yeah. I mean, like everything he touches. Yeah, uh, yeah, pretty much. But uh, he's a politician, and if he's a politician, he can be poisoned and get away with it. Not saying that's a good thing, but uh, that is nonetheless how it yeah. is. And speaking yeah. of Kurtzman, we've got some tangentially attached news here. We've got uh, some uh, first looks at uh, Prodigy. Goody. Well, there should be a hoot. Um, yeah. We got uh, the cast is going to include Riley Alazaraki, if I'm saying that right, as Rock Talk. Brett Gray as On My Block, or from On My Block is Doll. Uh, Angus Im Imri uh, from The Crown is Zero. Jason Matsukas, if I'm saying that right, from Infinite as Jankum Pong. Ella Purnell from Army of Dead as Gwyn. And D. Bradley Baker from SpongeBob as Murph. Uh, and here's a look at the cast and their characters. So there you go. And here's some more first looks. That means we're probably due for a trailer, it looks like, here in the next... Pretty soon, weeks, should be I'd pretty imagine. Soon. Nothing in this few images here makes me think anything. Star, none of this makes me feel like I'm watching, looking at something Star Trek. None of it. Well, to be fair, this is the series that's made for kids, so yeah, it is. It's not made still. for us. Although I will say that Star Trek, the animated series back in the seventies, was also made for kids. Kids. And that was most definitely made for us because some of the best episodes in Star Trek canon are in that series. This, however, they seem to have gone out of their way to alienate anyone above like the age of, I don't know, seven or something, six or seven or something. Yeah, they got the, that Jason Manzoukas who um, he has the very obnoxious voice. That's his signature. So we can kind of in pretty much uh, surmise that the Janko Pong Pog is going to be the most annoying one of the cast. <laughs> yeah, the thing I like though is that they they, they seem to have like the sort of small picture, but he looks like the guy who was in in the um, uh, the the gr the dictator movie, uh, the one oh, from uh, South 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 Cohen. Yeah, <laughs> it looks like his co-star from there. <laughs> uh, so so that's cool i guess i like that movie but yeah but but again it's, yeah again it's, it's not made for me but then again nothing star trek these days is made for me 
Um, and yeah, I don't know what else there is to say about it. And uh, with that, Tom, did you, are you still here or did you have to go out and let the, the doggy out? I think you had to go and let the doggy out. Oh, Sadie wanted out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no. Um, so, how excited are you for Prodigy script? Have you heard anything about like uh, it from a scripting point of view, or have you heard any buzz about it? Uh, I've not heard any buzz. I've only heard a little bit of buzz about Strange New Worlds, but that's not really whole whole lot to report other than they're almost done filming, and uh, they're hoping it's going to be good. But they have the reservations. Uh, that's because it's a it's. They, they know what they're, a lot of the writers that are working on that show know exactly what they're up against. And they're very well aware of the reception of Discovery. I can, I can tell you that. That's what I've heard. Um, so, oh, so, so they're not under any illusions that Discovery is actually liked no matter what they try to <laughs> fool people in, in public into thinking. <laughs> they're definitely not under any delusions that Discovery is good. That is, that is true. They, I'm pretty sure from what I what I've heard, not just through them, but also through some of the people that work on the crew and uh, as well that, uh, yeah, they're just really hoping people like it and they don't know. They're very unsure right now. There's a lot of doubt. Uh, they'll never say it, obviously, publicly, of course. Obviously. But, um, yeah, they, they have some doubt, so they're hoping. And uh, the cast is as hoping as well. Uh, yeah. So. yeah, they're probably also under no illusions that this is popular. Or like that, that that they're coming from something popular, that they that they're coming onto a fan base that's been pretty burned already. First by by uh, Discovery, then by Picard. I don't know which was worse. Actually, I do know Picard was worse. Picard was worse. That? Discovery's not much better. <laughs> You can um, ignore Discovery, at least. Yeah, yeah, that's like the thing. Discovery, you can easily pretend never happened. Uh, even though it's a 25% difference or all that, Picard is much more difficult to ignore because it has the same actors, many of them. Not just that, it has the worst, like, 10, 15 minutes in the history of Star Trek with that turning him into a robot and all that shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it'll be... Anyway. Yeah, again, Star Trek is dead to me at this point. Like, yeah. I can't I can't even re-watch the original series. No, well, certainly not Next Generation. Like, I tried a little while ago, and I was like, it's not the same anymore. They retroactively ruined the Next Generation for me. Well, that hasn't happened for me. Uh, I'm, I'm very easy able, easily able to compartmentalize. <laughs> Yeah, so, maybe in time I'll be able to, but uh, but uh, not the just, last time I tried. Just gotta remember, like none of the the people that made those actors say those words were involved in Picard. So no, this yeah. is pretty obvious. But yeah, Tom, did we have any other stories? Today? Well, we know that uh, Knives Out Two is moving along smoothly, so thank God. Uh, <laughs> Matrix Four star Jessica Henwick has joined the cast, so that means they're in the process of casting. So that means he's staying the fuck away from Star Wars a little bit longer. Um, and other minor news, yeah, it's pretty much that's the the bis, big big business. Uh, there's one minor story that I found interesting, but I don't know if you or anybody else will hear. But if you're a Blu-ray fan, anyway, uh, Columbia has announced their next uh, line of uh, 4K restorations. Uh, for those who may remember, la uh, was yet last year, the year before, they released a six film set, and now they have their next set of films because, of course. I just bought Taxi Driver in 4K on digital. So they've got to release it in 4K on Blu-ray, of course, you know. Of course. But yeah, this One set else. will this set will include The Social Network, Taxi Driver, Sense and Sensibility, Anatomy of a Murder, Oliver and Stripes. So a couple I'm really looking forward to there. So not a bad set, uh, not exactly some of the movies I was hoping for. For those who may remember Sony put out there to where you could actually vote on the movies that were going to be put into this. So those are the movies that evidently won. Well, well Stripe the 4K will be funny. Um, yeah, that, I think that was one I voted for, at least. Actually, so for the John Larroquette scenes. <laughs> I voted for, like, uh, La Bamba, that, Karate Kid 2, and a couple other ones. But I think Karate Kid 2 is going to come anyway, because I think they had to remaster it in 4K for Cobra Kai. So chances are they'll just release that as a regular release. Oh, they're probably anyway. all of them. Oh, yeah, I'm sure they did. 
Um, but yeah, so that's the next line of one. I'm not surprised taxi. I knew taxi driver is going to be in there, even though I bought it, but I got it for cheap. So it's like, whatever. <laughs> I was like, yeah. But anyway, uh, yes, Lawrence of Arabia is coming out solo, uh, Maestro. Although that's kind of another thing that pisses me off, but not really. Uh, all the releases in their original box that are coming out solo, which they kind of lied to us and told us they weren't going to be available any other way. So, uh, but that included like movies like uh, Lawrence of Arabia and, uh, League of Their Own, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, um, Jerry Maguire, uh, Gandhi. I think that was all six of them. Was that six movies? No, I'm missing one. Uh, Dr. Strangelove was the other one. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, that was a great set. I love that. Yeah, well, that's awesome. I, I, I take me some Dr. Strangelove in 4K. Oh, it's great. It, it, it That set is really good. This one I'm a little disappointed by because there's only like two or three titles. I'm like, yeah. The rest of them I probably wouldn't pick up, but who knows? Yeah. And that's about it, folks. It's Monday. Yeah, slowly. And we Tuesday, managed to but, keep it uh, under three hours for once. Yeah, not too bad. Think, Can we catch up on all the super chats? We got them all. I'm all going to do a quick so double check. Uh, quick recap and double check that we uh that we while you're doing everything. that, there was some sad news over the weekend. We lost uh Character actor and veteran actor uh, Ned Beatty, uh, of course. You may know him best from movies like Superman uh, and Deliverance. Uh, but a great, great actor. Just a ton of great performances out of the guy. Always a welcome treat in any movie. Even some of the worst films, he's the best part. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah, Otis, exactly. Yeah, we lost Otis this last weekend. So that was that one's oh, that really made me sad. Yeah, me too, Sean. I was like, oh man, yeah, yeah, yeah. And of super chats, we had STR Red Wolf who said, "Wait, they're making a Five Nights at Freddy's." Yeah, movie? we brought that one up. Jeez, yeah. yeah. Well, just to just, just to play it safe, jeez, that's going to suck. Even though Nicolas Cage being in it, yeah, and that's where uh, I pointed out it's already out. Yeah, and the 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 rookie critic said Willie's Wonderland, one of Nick's best works, and Super Blubber Puss uh, says, "Check out the numerous Chuck E. Cheese." Fight videos on YouTube, Andre. <laughs> oh, no, this sounds interesting. Fight videos in Chuck E. Cheese. Like, yeah. now this gets the imagination going. I kind of have an idea where this might be going and who's doing the fighting, but we shall see. Yeah. Uh, um, we also then... lost Clarence Williams III. That's right. I, for, uh, I forgot to mention that as well. Most well known from Tales from the Hood. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. And then Mihon says for 20 Swedish krona, who was the writer? Script said destroyed all. Alex Kersman? <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, think, uh, that's I, I can't think about. of anyone else we've sort of spoken about today that destroyed everything quite as badly as Alex Kurtzman. I mean, he is... Uh, there's very few people that have... Um, have um, done as I've much, had that uh, impact in the industry. Yeah. <laughs> if he was only one number higher, he'd be clever, but it's 665, not 666 on the back of the test. Well, give him time. Give him time. No, because the devil be clever. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. He'll get there. Give him He's time. just a destroyer. Yeah. Oh, he uh, said what? Dave something, Mihan said? Dave? Uh, mm. Oh, Dave Callahan. I don't oh. Yeah, I mean... Him personally don't don't have any gripes, but his writers, not, as a writer, Dave Callahan's not that <laughs> not that great. Yeah, and then and the other writer, the one that wrote on Loki, I don't know if you saw I that, Andre. Loki. Yeah, I sent you the article. That's the guy who's writing Kevin Feige's fucking Star Wars movie. Yeah, we spoke about it a little bit when. Uh, yeah, when I we tried to run. Yeah, it's been a hell of a morning here. So anyway, yeah, he's also in Half Bakes. That's right, Monkey Jeebus. Yeah, Clarence Clarence Williams III, that is. Oh, um, Mod Squad guy, yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Mod Squad. That's right. He was in that, too. I forgot. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sad weekend as far as that goes. But, uh, well, hopefully we can have some good news to look forward to this week. I have a feeling we're going to have a Star Trek trailer to break down here before too long, it looks like. Um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting, interesting change of events as far as Clarice goes, but not surprising. Uh, I wonder if it has more to do with the MGM deal than anything, but we'll see. So, uh, still can't believe they spend that much in episode. Jesus. Me too. <laughs> yeah, that was a waste of money. They're not getting right? back again. Yeah. 
That's a lot of money. Anyway, um, thank you so much, guys, for being here. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, you guys make this possible. Don't forget to uh, do do what you can to help out Bird of Prey. Uh, I think Andre will probably add the link if he hasn't already. It's, to it's already in the description. There you go. I figured as oh, yeah. much. Yeah, um, it was there so before we even started today. Please do your best to help him out if you can. I Like I said, I know times are tough right now, but times are even tougher for him. So keep that in mind. And uh, if you have, if you want to know what's going on, check out his channel. Actually, his channel is multiple ones. But uh, one of his later videos recently leads to his other channel that explains everything the man's been through. And it's... It, it, the guy's been through a lot of shit and, and just to be able to just having to deal with what's going on right now on top of everything else is just, I can't imagine it. So my heart goes out to the guy going to do what I can to help him out this uh, payday as well. So do what you guys can for real. I normally don't beg like this for help, but he really needs it. And I know we're doing everything we can right now to get him the, the medical help he needs as well. So if anybody knows anybody in that area, I know Gary put out all the info last week. So check in with him or uh, I think uh, his producer was handling most of it. So either way, get a hold of whoever you can if you know anybody and do anything to help there on that end. Uh, but yeah, if you want to know what's going on, check out his channel. Do do subscribe as well. He does a lot of great watch parties and discussions. I've popped in quite a few times. So yeah, he has a Cinema Sunday show, which is a lot of fun. There you go. Anyway, yeah. Andre. And uh, with that, I would like to say thank you to every single one who have been watching us today, supporting us with your super chats. Thanks also to to the two Matts, including Matt uh, Matthew Kadish of the Salty Nerd Podcast. So be sure to check them out as well. Link is in the description. And finally, Destiny check Captain. out Toxic Femininity later tonight. And the Destiny Captain, did we miss uh, his super chat? I'm I shall sure. do a quick check. Uh, I'm not sure. see if we got anything right. I don't think I missed anything. I don't but think I'm going to do, uh, do a double check anyway, of course, as one does. Let's see, it was Destiny Captain. Is that what we yep. said? Yep, Destiny Captain. Let's see, here we see. Uh, Destiny Captain said for $9.99. The kids over at Dial the Gate and Gate World on YouTube seem to have some inside info of what's happening with Stargate. Would Midnight's Edge be open to, to having on for a Stargate episode at some point? Um, yeah, we missed that one. Them over, yeah, well, actually, we did miss that one. I don't sorry, know how, but, but yeah, that I, was I don't a big know. one. I don't yeah, know I don't, yeah, that was a good, really sorry. About that. Um, yeah, sure, so we're much. open to that. I'm not, um, I'm not real up on the Stargate universe, but I know a few people who are to a point. Script, are you a big, huge Stargate fan at all? Um, I, I enjoyed the movie and I did like Richard D Dean Anderson in the first few seasons of Stargate. I yeah. kind of dipped out of it because as that show was picking up, my career was picking up, so I wasn't able to watch as much. But uh, yeah, um, no, I, I, I dig Stargate. Uh, I, it's got a fantastic fan base on par with Star Trek, uh, at least at the time with regards to the relationship between the cast and the and the fans. That's always been a real positive one, so... I mean, yeah, yeah if you know it. those guys personally or want to send them our way, do, please. We'll definitely talk to them. We're always open to talk to anybody. I mean, we can't guarantee anything's going to happen right away, but we're definitely open to trying. Yeah, absolutely. So because we are, I don't know much about Stargate beyond the absolute basics. And, uh, and I knew a little bit about what was going on with the reboot before the merger. Yeah. Uh, but how things have been, been thrown uh, uh, thrown around after, I cannot say. Yeah, that's my thing. Outside of the movie, I probably know more about the recent behind-the-scenes stuff more than anything. And a lot of that's gone silent since there's been more wheeling and dealing going on. So I, I'm not even sure. Andre probably knows more than I do at this point. No, no, I, I know nothing right now. I mean, that threw, I haven't heard anything since that, uh, since that was announced. That threw a wrench and everything. Yeah. So uh, right now I know things are kind of just floating around, but who knows? And I know we do plan on hopefully getting uh, Mr. Almost back as well. So, you know, there's other possibilities as that's other battle star. That's Battlestar Galactica. I know, but which, what we had, uh, 
Lou Diamond Phillips there that day too, and he's on Stargate one. He's Stargate, he? yes. Yeah, okay, that's what I meant then. I knew one of them. I don't. I didn't even watch Battlestar remake. Okay, I know the original. <laughs> <laughs> I saw, oh, it's a remake. Fuck that noise. I was that kid way back when. I don't give remakes a great chance right away. I'll I'll give them a chance when I got nothing else to fucking do. Like that's when I watched the Total Recall remake when it was like already five, six years old. <laughs> like, oh, geez. I remember when that was in production and that yeah, was like, like I had nothing better idea. to do. And I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna waste some fucking time and brain cells. And I did. So I was like, okay, I'm glad I got that out of the fucking way. <laughs> yeah. I remember I saw that in theaters. I remember being annoyed with one thing of it, namely the elevator that goes through the earth. I thought that was such a cool concept that it should have been used in its own original movie rather than being wasted on a remake that had no future beyond the immediate box office and DVD sales in the next six months. Uh, RoboCop, on the other hand, Joshua, since I'm such a huge fan of RoboCop, that was one I went into, like, when you go into the doctor and you know you're going to get bad news, you got to have a surgery. Like, that that's the way I went into that movie. I was just, like, wincing the whole way into it, and then by the time I got out of it, I'm like, okay, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. I mean, there were some interesting ideas there, but overall, it was mostly harmless, and nobody's going to remember this shit in 10 years, so. Yeah. Our RoboCop remake was better. Yeah, that was a great... Yeah collection of everybody just doing it well and know? remaking robocop in, the, in and of itself is stupid you just you just need to pick it up yeah you don't need to do it he, he's already kind of like a comic book character in, in, in and of itself so you just kind of like pick up the adventures of robocop that's all you need to do don't need to retell the tale it's like batman we all know how he started well i mean i would say the tv series there's a couple of tv series and miniseries of robocop that were quite decent um, they had great the ideas, same, but they couldn't execute them very well. Yeah, not often. Yeah, they, they they didn't have the entirety of the nuance of what original RoboCop did. But um, yeah, it was it, it pulled off some pretty impressive things given the the budget and the uh, uh, and the the tight schedules they had to shoot with. I mean, I I got the idea of what they did with the remake, not to go far off the deep end because now we're crawling on three hours. But like, you know, the original film was you know a guy who lost his humanity trying to gain it back. This was the opposite; they were taking away his humanity throughout the movie. So I got that they made the wife a bit more prominent and they gave her a different kind of role than they did in the original. I'm like, okay, you're doing something different there, and you know, I kind of liked how they amped up the corporatism of it all. I mean, there was elements to it that were like, okay, I I get the idea, but it was just missing that spark the Verhoeven brought to the original. And a lot of that was the humor, the tongue in cheek nature of it. The, what made RoboCop better than a movie should be when it's called RoboCop, basically. Like yeah. that time RoboCop shot the guy in the dick. And with that, let's get some qualms in the rain. What do you say? Yeah, let's do that. Uh, cool. Before that script, where can people find you? Oh yeah. Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at ScriptDoctorPhD. I do have a YouTube channel uh, where I review and analyze uh, shows such as Batman, uh, sorry, Batwoman, uh, uh, Mandalorian, uh, and Star Trek Discovery. Uh, it's a little on a break right now as I am currently writing up a couple of screenplays uh, for some people. Uh, but when uh, that is done, the, the channel will be back up. So if you want to see where I will be popping up on whatever live stream uh, I am, just follow me on Twitter. There you go. And Andre, anything we got to plug this week? I think we're going to get back to Bond, if I'm not mistaken, but I got to double check with uh, Robert. But uh, outside of that, I don't know if there's... That's just stay tuned for more scripted there content. There's going to be more of it this week. There you go. And with that, finally, here's some koalas in the rain. Koalas in the rain. Koalas in the rain. No fucks given. Koala's in the rain, koala's in the rain, no fucks given, koala, 